there. Man, we're happy to see you here today for this very special episode of Pick 6 Movies. Now, what makes it so special? I am so glad you asked. Look, you know me. I'm Chad Cooper, and here in a few minutes, I'm going to be joined by my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, to start the show proper. But that's not what makes it special at all. Now, you also know, normally, on Pick 6 Movies, we select six films, all related to a single theme. And then on each episode, we discuss the people in front of and behind the camera for one of these movies to provide some insights on how the movies were made. And then on top of that, we give a detailed review of each and every movie to see if they're any good. And in this episode, we're going to do all of that. But this episode is supersized. It's shockingly long. We spent more time talking about the big screen adaptation of Dragnet more than any other movie we've ever discussed in the history of Pick 6 movies. Now, how did that happen? Well, we kept getting distracted, and a few times we kind of forgot what movie we were talking about. But I will say we had a heck of a good time laughing our way through this buddy cop comedy that's based on a 1960s era police drama. Now, if it's your first time here, you are in for a treat. Now, if you're a returning Pick 6 Movies fan, you are in for quite the ride along. And without wasting any more time, let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to explain to you, the good people of the world, exactly how Dragnet, a radio program, became Dragnet, a TV program, that became Dragnet, a major motion picture, that ultimately became Dragnet, the subject of this episode of Pick 6 Movies, which, if you're keeping score at home, is episode 3 of season 12's theme, As Seen on TV. Bo, why don't you get in here and give us just the facts? Good God, this is awful. We and I mean Americans here, are a people who love a good crime. Maybe not you, gentle listener, maybe you are exempt from the lure of the macabre. But you are in the minority and can skip ahead about 20 minutes and get to the jokey jokes, content that you have learned nothing and your concretized beliefs are unchallenged. Go on, skedaddle. Now, for those of you left, you're my people. The people who hear the tale of Jack the Ripper and need to know more. The ones who worried over the fate of the Lindbergh baby and still puzzle over the fate of child beauty pageant contestants. And that's nothing new, of course. The fascination with crime and murder has been with us, well, forever. One of the first stories in the Bible is a murder story. Cain and Abel is an old-fashioned fratricide and as fitting on law and order as the pages of the good book. And this obsession with crime predates our obsession with police, mainly because of how relatively new police departments are in the grand scheme of things. Here in these United States, the first organized police force was in 1838 in Boston. Before that, keeping the order in communities was mostly done by watchmen, who were volunteers that kept an eye on things after dark, and often fell asleep, or got loaded on account of being up all night, with nothing to do in 1825. See, back in Boston, the harbor was a bustling place with lots of goods coming in and out, and people stealing those goods was becoming a real problem. The owners of the ships, and said goods, were spending money hiring people to stand guard at the docks when they had a great idea. Say, they said, what if we got the chumps who live in Boston to pay for all this security instead of us? That way, stay with me, we can make more money. All the other merchants seemed to think that was a good idea, so they hoodwinked the people of Boston into paying for a police force to guard shipments and other stuff too, you know, if they got around to it. In the southern states, they had a working model of local police forces, only it was an abomination against man. That's right, America's original sin, slavery, figures into policing, and didn't you just know that's how this was going to go? Slave patrols, as they were horrifyingly called, existed in most larger southern communities to keep human beings kept in bondage from getting away from said lives in bondage. While technically the military of the United States kept the peace in the South in the years immediately following the Civil War, the old slave patrols quickly rose to official status as local policing operations that strictly enforced local segregation laws. You know what? This is all gross. Let's leave this out for a while. At least in Boston, the police were just corporate shills, and not total racists. 
So in the northern states, there was a rise in labor unions alongside the rise of industrialization. Community business owners were getting pretty tired of hiring all these strike busters and thugs to break up picket lines. And depending on which city you were in, you were probably seeing a rise in immigration from Italians or Irish, Germans, Catholics, Eastern Europeans, basically lots of people looking to America as a place to find their fortune. Except those communities weren't crazy about neighborhoods suddenly filled with the smells of food they didn't recognize, and what's with all the talking in a language that ain't American? So, of course, police forces were established in all the big cities to maintain law and order, a dog whistle even in the 19th century for anti-immigration sentiment. These turn-of-the-century cops were just as likely to break up labor strikes as rescue cats out of trees, or toss some poor Irish bastard out on his keister when the poor Irish guy stumbled into the bar with a no Irish sign on it. In addition to the industrialization sweeping the nation, there was also the introduction of citywide party politics. The political machines were in their prime, where a couple of rich dudes could chart the course of tens of thousands of residents while being half off their ass on brandy. Because police chiefs and captains were often picked by local politicians, they might serve as a private police for the political machines, shutting down businesses rival to the ones owned by the political bosses. By the time Prohibition rolled around, police took payoffs to allow some bars to stay in business. These police forces were just as corrupt as the organized crime families they were portrayed as opposing in films of the 1930s. In 1929, then-President Hoover appointed the Wickersham Commission to investigate why police departments all suck so badly, what well, with all the institutional racism and xenophobia and grifting and all. The result of this study was that police forces were too beholden to local politics, and so there was a push towards professionalism, to an isolation from outside influences, in a sense that the police were on their own island of law. So, take slave patrols, political armies, and hired goons, tell them they're in charge and no one can push them around anymore, and you may be surprised to learn that this has not always worked out so well. In an era where police forces are rife with internal corruption of one form or another, and I'm grouping systemic racism in here along with other kinds of corruptions, including financial and moral, you start to sell those same organizations leftover military hardware that you don't need anymore, and that sounds like a party of the most awful kind. But despite the terrible roots of modern policing, there has always been a competing narrative to the less fun truth of police in America. The myth was that all these guys in blue, or the cooler plainclothes cops who showed up after the boys in blue to rub their chins and look over the crime scene, that these guys and gals were the thin blue line separating society from chaos. Without the police, the inmates would run the asylum. We developed tropes of these cops, the haunted veteran cops, the fresh-faced young cop ready to take on the world, the good-natured cop who's just about to retire, the buddy cop, the cop and a half, the kindergarten cop, the maniac cop and many more. We're cop crazy. Even back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when police departments were at their corrupt worst, Americans had stories like those written by Edgar Allan Poe and stories that ran in True Detective, a pulp magazine that recounted heinous murders and sold millions of copies. In the 1940s, these pulpier magazines were replaced by crime comics, but all of them featured detectives like Sam Spade and C. Auguste Dupin and Miss Marple, who were all investigating murders as amateur sleuths. But then, in 1945, Lawrence Treat published a novel by the name of V, as in Victim. In this novel, the experts weren't private detectives stumbling across murders on trains or on Nile cruises. These were real cops investigating real crime. As World War II was wrapping up and the country turned to peacetime matters, part of the American psyche was still entrenched in mystery and violence. Not only did you have comics and books, movies started to get heavy on the cops versus robbers themes too. And not just cops versus robbers, but cops doing what cops do to catch criminal. The police procedural, if you will. And Hollywood did. The Naked City, The Street With No Name, He Walked By Night, great titles that headline movies all about cops doing the gritty, filthy, sausage-making business of police work while the rest of the world went on its merry way, guarded by these urban soldiers from the true terror that lurked on city streets. And one of those movies, 1948's He Walked By Night, featured a young Jack Webb in a supporting role. Jack Webb was a radio guy who had big aspirations, and when the technical advisor on He Walks By Night, an LAPD detective named Marty Wynn, 
suggested to Webb that a police procedural might work just as well on the radio as it did on the big screen, Webb knew that was a great idea. And the very next year, Dragnet premiered on the radio. Much like America's obsession with true crime, the popularity of Dragnet ebbed and flowed, but it proved surprisingly resistant to death. When Webb started, the whole idea was to do a show that was realistic in presenting the day-to-day -day trials of work in the Los Angeles Police Department without melodramatic acting or flourishes to paint the shows as anything but authentic. And it began with an iconic line that would change radio and television forever. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Yeah, it's a little bit like the beginning of Law & Order, ain't it? Well, Dragnet excelled on radio and made the leap to television in 1951, where you could actually see Joe Friday, Jack Webb's iconic cop, smoke Chesterfields instead of just talk about smoking Chesterfields on the radio show. Initially, Webb shied away from the plum role of the by-the-books cop, afraid he wasn't the right guy for television. But the networks insisted, wisely, and Webb appeared in, as well as directed the show. This initial run of Dragnet was all black and white, populated by radio actors, who were all striving for the most realistic deliveries possible to maintain the verite approach. And the show did gangbusters, for the first few years anyways. The popularity waned in 57, and by 1959, it was out of the top 30 shows and subsequently canceled. Webb tried his hand at some writing afterwards, and took on some small parts in movies, but nothing quite panned out. In 1963, he got a job taking over the detective show 77 Sunset Strip, and the resulting changes from Webb's more, let's say, mainstream ethos sent the show into a cancellation death spin. Once that show was done, Webb and actor Jeffrey Hunter formed their own production company to make shows their own way. The first out of the gate, Temple Houston, a story about the lawyer relative of Sam Houston. It was a rushed mess of a show and only lasted one season. By 1966, Webb was hot on the idea of a new Dragnet series and wrote a TV movie-length episode that would reunite Webb with Joe Friday and would reintroduce the world to Dragnet. The TV movie was a hit, and the show was brought back as a mid-season replacement. The year was added to the title, so the show would forever be known as Dragnet 67 or Dragnet 68, etc. And it set its tone right off the bat. Here's a line from the first episode of the Dragnet revival, Dragnet 67, as Joe Friday grills Blue Boy. A hippie. What's your name, son? You can see my name if you look hard enough. Come on now, what's your name? Don't you know my name? My name's Blue Boy. What do you think, Joe? Card wheels? No sugar cubes. I'll make you book. He's been dropping that acid we've been hearing about. Yes, it's very silly and campy now, but at the time, it must have felt like murder she wrote for the hippies and yippies who saw this as their grandparents' television show. It was either terribly out of touch or terribly comforting while hiding its head in the sand, depending on how you looked at it. By 1970, Webb decided that he wanted to put the wraps on Dragnet so he could focus on his new production company, Mark 7 Productions. Most of these were procedurals too, of one kind or another. The DA, O'Hara United States Treasury, and Emergency, which was his last bona fide hit. Jack Webb was working on a 1983 revival of Dragnet when he popped a valve and left us in 1982. Webb loved the institutions of government and that very American story of blue-collar folks who went to work every day to put their lives on the lines for their fellow Americans. That was the America Jack Webb lived in, or wanted to, and it was the America he certainly portrayed. In many ways, Dragnet is as much a part of our myth of American police as anything else, and it influenced all the police procedurals that came after. Shows like Hill Street Blues and the aforementioned Law & Order and CSI and all those spinoffs, literal decades of television can be charted back to a radio show from 1949 and the Chesterfield smooth voice and clip demeanor of its creator. And of course, our obsession with true crime in general is at a new high. Podcasts and documentaries and television series and movies, my own pet theory is that in times of turmoil and upheaval, we all become a little bit more interested in how dark things can get. A peek into the there but for the grace of God go eyes of the world. As we see the world around us become something unfamiliar, 
the old stories first told by Victoria and Gaslight are strangely comforting in their familiarity, if not in their content. But speaking of bad content, did you know they made a movie called Dragnet? And not that TV movie from 1966. And did you know Oscar winner Tom Hanks was in it? And did you know Oscar nominee Dan Aykroyd was in it too? And did you further know that Dan Aykroyd was an Oscar nominee? Yeah, for Driving Miss Daisy. I forgot too. Anyway, Dan Aykroyd had been doing a Joe Friday impression for years. The first time he pulled it out publicly, his impression of Friday, I mean, was on an episode of Saturday Night Live way back in 1976. He and one of the SNL writers, a guy named Alan Zweibel, had written a script all about Joe Friday's nephew, which had them in stitches, I'm sure. They shot the script around some, and Universal brought in writer Tom Mankiewicz to clean the script up. Aykroyd, whose bonkers script for the original Ghostbusters is a thing of Hollywood legend, bristled but fell in line with Mankiewicz's changes. Mankiewicz was a big deal after having done cleanup work on Superman 1 and 2, along with writing Lady Hawk, which is one of the best movies about a couple that turns into animals you're likely to see starring Matthew Broderick. Anywho, Mankiewicz didn't like the director Universal wanted at the helm of the Dragnet movie, so they said to Tom Mankiewicz, if you think you're so smart, why don't you direct the movie? And so he did. The script called for a wise-cracking sidekick to Aykroyd's Straight-Laced Friday, and so they went to the most wise-crackingest of all actors, Jim Belushi. But he was busy, so they went with what Hollywood has come to think of as the guy you get when you can't get Jim Belushi, Tom Hanks. Now, Hanks' star was on the rise, but there were plenty of duds in the mix to make his movie future anything but certain. While Splash and Bachelor Party hit in 1984, his attempt to capitalize with starring turns in Volunteers and The Man with One Red Shoe and Nothing in Common were all middling to poor outings. His real break, Big, wouldn't come for a couple more years. He was closer to the days of playing crazy LARPers and mazes and monsters than being an Oscar winner. Still, he got the co-starring role as the energetic Pep Streback, and we were off. We'll get to the film itself in just a second, but it was a reasonable hit for the studio, and reasonably critically received. All this reasonableness is maybe the reason it's not well remembered. Hanks would of course go on to fame and fortune as the guy who gets Meg Ryan at the end of the movie, and Aykroyd would go on to make a great vodka and a cool skull decanter. Minkowicz passed away in 2010, but left behind an impressive body of work. I particularly admire his deep involvement with the show Heart to Heart, and how there hasn't been a big screen adaptation of that, I'll never know. The film has weirdly become an artifact of its time, more notable for being an early Tom Hanks role than as a skewering of Dragnet, because that's not what it was. At the heart of both the show and the movie, there is an optimism and a belief in institutions that feels quaint now. But enough this maudlin examination of the reality encroaching on shared myth. Let's do some dumb voices and make some poop jokes. Chad, get in here. Ladies and gentlemen, Guy and Girl Fridays, it's 1987's Dragnet. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Pick 6 Movies. This is Season 12, Episode 3? Episode 3. Three. Yeah, jeez, boy. Time flies <laughs> when you're living in a post-apocalyptic hellscape. I, of course, am Bo Ranstel. With me, as ever, the pep to my Strebeck. The pep in my Strebeck, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, Chad Cooper, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Bo. I'm excited to talk about Dragnet. Sure you are. Let's just get this out of the way right now. There is no way that a movie that is so blindly pro-police could ever be made to, in the current circumstance. Let's just acknowledge for a second that this movie thinks that the police are the best. I don't think most movies featuring police officers made in the late 70s until probably 2003 could be made today. 
That's right. Lethal Weapon, anything involving Dirty Harry Callahan. I'd say you get away with Serpico, Copland. <laughs> you could do Copland because the cops are the bad guys. Well, except for one cop. Maybe Training Day. Yeah, you could pull that off. End of Watch, which is that really good Jake Gyllenhaal movie. Mm -hmm. These are all films where the, the cops are the villains. That's not the movie we're talking about tonight. We are talking about Dragnet. I want to see that remake of Police Academy they keep promising right now. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Mahoney and his wacky gang get hold of a bunch of leftover Defense Department equipment and just roll <laughs> into a mob of protesters, shooting off their rubber bullets and tear gas and pepper grenades. And, you know, hijinks. That would be an unfortunate movie. Probably be in poor taste at, at this particular place in time. Well, the good news is that no movies are ever going to be shown in movie theaters ever again, so you could watch it in the privacy of your own home and make your own judgments. Finally, we're getting to that old ultimate world where we all just self-isolate to the point that we just become our own little tribes of weirdos i'm down with that it's really what i've been wanting all along but you know what's not a very good movie dragnet eh, do i disagree with that i don't know let's talk about it you noted in your show open that this movie has two really big movie stars mm -hmm. by today's standards but i just kind of wanted to at least provide a little bit more context and get your perspective on where their careers were when these movies were made okay so I submit that Dan Aykroyd has made three good comedies in his career. The Blues Brothers, Trading Places, and the original Ghostbusters. Everything else is not very good. All right, let me review that as we're talking, but go on. Well, let me just submit a few uh, exhibits. He was in Gross Point Blank. That's a great movie. Well, that's like saying he was in Temple of Doom. Neighbors, Coneheads, Couch Trip, Great Outdoors, My Stepmother is an Alien, Loose Cannons, Nothing But Trouble, Exit to Eden, a movie where Dan Aykroyd and Rosie O'Donnell go undercover at a private resort island for BDSM enthusiasts. And that movie was directed by Gary Marshall, brother to Penny and the guy who brought us pretty woman that got made because ann rice wrote it right that's no excuse for anything you're absolutely right no look nobody is gonna defend <laughs> exit eden on this program i think some people will argue that spies like us is funny it's or not. maybe it has some funny moments but that is a movie in my opinion that tries way too hard to entertain you it doesn't age well not because it's racist or homophobic, which it probably is. I haven't seen it in quite some time. It's just one of those movies that the physical comedy and letting Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd just sort of riff mm -hmm. doesn't work as well by today's comedic standards. Because Chevy Chase is an asshole. I like Coneheads Despite Myself. I think it's a, a fine movie. I don't think it's a great movie. I think it's fine. And there are some pretty funny moments in it. I mean, do you give him credit for Driving Miss Daisy? He's just better in dramatic roles than he was in comedic roles. He was in that My Girl movie, mm -hmm. which he served his purpose there. You mentioned that he got his Oscar nod for playing the son in Driving Miss Daisy. He was good in Sneakers, which was kind of a comedic role. But let's be honest, he's just playing himself as a conspiracy theorist adult man child oh it's the best but you no, know, you're <laughs> right like he is he when he did dragnet he's coming off spies like us ghostbusters is a few years ago by this point Mm -hmm. It's one of his last big starring roles after My Stepmother is an Alien was probably the last thing <laughs> where it was like, we're going to let Dan Aykroyd try to carry this movie. And nope. they were like, oh, this is a bad idea, it turns out. The thing I like about Dan Aykroyd is when he goes for a character, he really goes for it, which is sort of what I like about Dragnet. There is no irony in Dan Aykroyd's performance. He clearly is invested in this. Let's talk a little bit about Tom Hanks and what was going on in his world. Yeah. Because at the time this movie was made, he was doing his best interpretation of Michael Keaton and Bill Murray with a dash of Steve Gutenberg for just flavor. And don't get me wrong, I loved Tom Hanks and everything that he was putting out at this time. But this is not the Tom Hanks who went on to make movies that your dad and your grandpa loved to watch. Because he was making, as you noted in the open, Splash and Bachelor Party and Volunteer. 
Volunteers and the Money Pit and nothing in common with Jackie Gleason and starting out with his work in Bosom Buddies and he was the original drunk uncle on Family Ties and Bo, he was on an episode of Happy Days where he played a guy seeking revenge on Arthur Fonzarelli and he showed up and he kicks the Fonz's ass. Ass. Who knew Tom Hanks was so tough? Not the Fonz, because he got his ass kicked by him. I don't recall this episode, but surely by the end of it, Tom Hanks got his comeuppance from the Fonz. So here's what happens. All right. For those, <laughs> yeah, uh, for, for everybody who doesn't care, which is everybody, uh-huh. just skip ahead about 30 or 40 seconds. Uh-huh. The Fonz picked on this guy when he was a kid, Tom Hanks. Uh-huh. And then Tom Hanks spent his whole life learning martial arts to come back and kick the Fonz's ass. Uh-huh. And then he comes in and the Fonz like, you can have one shot at me. And Tom Hanks does a roundhouse kick. And this is all taking place inside Al's, AKA Arnold's. Sure. And he kicks the Fonz in the chest and knocks him backwards through this window out out of the restaurant and then tom hanks does that wheeze laugh that he's so famous for yeah. and then everybody's like holy shit the Fonz just got killed or something and he's like he's the greatest thing in the world and then the Fonz comes walking in the live audience goes ape shit and you're like oh the Fonz is gonna kick this dude's ass but his comeuppance is really essentially the Fonz saying i had that coming you were in the right i treated you badly now let's be friends and so they end um in a good place that's nice. I'm glad it worked out like that. I know. Welcome back to the show, everyone, who <laughs> skipped ahead of that boring story from the early, <laughs> early 1980s. Yeah, check the <laughs> the chapter demarcation in the notes. <laughs> But in this movie, he still had not made big. This is not the Tom Hanks you know, as you said. This is the Tom Hanks that was famous. Yeah, you knew who he was. Yeah. But he wasn't the actor you counted on for good entertainment. No, 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 no. He was just like, he was a funny guy. He was on the cusp of going on to have a career that would be filled with multiple Academy Award nominations and accolades and the love of the country, which is kind of the opposite of what was going to happen to Dan Aykroyd's career. Most importantly, this is three years before the defining role in Joe versus the Volcano. Sure. One of the best movies of all time, (laughs) except for the third act. Other than that, it's great. But I also want to give a little more context to not only their careers, but when Dragnet came out in 87, it really set the stage for a wave of future remakes of these classic 1960s shows. There was My Favorite Martian and Mm -hmm. the Beverly Hillbillies. There was Car 54, Where Are You? McHale's Navy, Sergeant Bilko, Leave It to Beaver, Dennis the Menace. They all came out, bam, 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 back to back to back over the next like six, seven years. And all of those movies, to one degree or another, were terrible. And so, you know, they all have one thing in common with Dragnet, that they're garbage. Let me ask you a question, because I thought about this a lot with this season. I I think that the reason a lot of these motion pictures that were made that are based on TV shows is just that they have built-in marketing appeal. It is the insert TV show name here movie. And then it's like, well, then we're going to cast this person who looks like the person you would expect to play this character and you're going to kind of draw on audiences and people just seem to show up out of this nostalgic obligation or a love of the source material or alternately there's just a curiosity of execution like how are they going to do this i once saw a wild west version of william shakespeare's comedy of errors purely out of curiosity Uh in fact i remember you once called me up on the phone and it was about the time that dragnet came out And you said, hey, man, they're making a big screen adaptation of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Uh And I immediately was sad because I was like, there's no way that that can be done. And then you informed me that Terry Gilliam was directing. And I was immediately happy because if anybody could do it, that's your guy. Sure. Yeah. And Johnny Depp was going to play Hunter Thompson. And I was totally in because this was Johnny Depp coming off of Gilbert Grape and Ed Wood. And he had not evolved into this caricature of himself, you know, that we know now. And I was one of those people that saw fear and loathing out of a love of the source material and a curiosity of execution. It was the same thing that happened to me when I saw Gus Van Sant's Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, but that movie was a fucking nightmare. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It was still an interesting disaster. He was going for an adaptation of that book, which seems impossible. And it turns out it is. Like, that was one of the cases where you roll the dice, like, can we make this a movie? Nope, nope, we sure can. Even Cowgirls Get the Blues only works as a book. Sorry. It's a great book, but it's a shitty movie. It feels like all of these 1960s inspired movies were just hastily put together. And they were just kind of these uninspired retreads of shows from a bygone era. And Dragnet really 
led the way to this parade of unwanted, disappointing wastes of time and money. And I think part of it too, man, is that this is the age the producers were. These were the shows that were on when they were kids. They got old enough that they get to call the shots and that's what they want to make. Right. Let me ask you another question about adaptations. And, and really this conversation is relevant to all of the movies that we're discussing this season. And in my opinion, it seems that these types of adaptations of TV shows, there's a handful of ways that they can be treated. The, the number one is that the movie is a faithful adaptation of the show, like what you saw in the Flintstones or the Adams Family movies, I think, or that way. I think that there are some that could argue that uh, the Transformers movies, at least the first one, tried to do that as well. And a second way that you can adapt a TV show to a film is that you do it in a very self-aware, self-deprecating fashion where the movie knows it's based on a TV show and the audience knows it's based on a TV show. And then you just have fun with it. Like in those Brady Bunch movies, they did that relatively well. Betty Thomas, who was on Hill Street Blues, she directed the first one of those movies. And she also directed the prequel to 28 Days Later, where Sandra Bullock is an alcoholic in a movie called 28 Days. I forgot that that movie ended with Sandy Bullock getting the like blood in her eye that, mm -hmm. and freaking out with the rage virus. <laughs> That's, That's pretty cool. Here's the good news. She kicked the booze. She now has a craving for human flesh and the, the gnashing of teeth. You trade one vice for another, Bo. That's how it always works. What are you going to do? Yeah, you're going to blow up like a, a house. You smoke too much. That's just cancer. Eh, <laughs> why not go with the rage virus, quite frankly? <laughs> I want to submit that there's a third way to adapt a TV show show to a movie that's where you just sort of slap the characters from the show into a poorly constructed plot you reference the tv show here and there and you really just don't seem to give a shit about making a quality <laughs> movie at all now of those three options Bo, which one do you think dragnet is i'm gonna give you a hint it's number three here's the problem is that the movie is not called jerry caesar the movie no that's what it should have been <laughs> but before we get to jerry caesar which we will i'm done uh, with context wait. now first we have to get to what this this movie begins with which is like the dragnet opening it's like shots of los angeles and some babes and there's this whole joe friday narration which which i've got this written down if you want to hear the whole thing but i 100 percent expected to hear it this is the city los angeles california interfacing humanity representing every race color <laughs> creed and persuasion that God, no matter how he is worshipped, chose in his infinite wisdom to deposit here in the cultural nexus of the Pacific Rim. Almost four million people work and play here, and like any other place anywhere, there are those who have it and those who want it. Those who have it enjoy it, no matter how they got it. Those who want it can get it by attempting to better themselves in a sympathetic community populated by decent citizens cheering them on. Or else, they can try to take it the easy way. Because even in the City of Angels, from time to time, some halos slip. That's where I come in. Doing my job to the best of my ability on a daily basis. I work here. I carry a badge. Dum, da, dum, dum. Right. And then danger dum, ahead, please. Da, dum, dum, dum. And so that dum, sets the tone for the film. Dum, 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 and it's dum, 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 Joe Friday, dum, a.k.a. Dan Aykroyd, marching into the police station. You also get a glimpse here of the ghost of Ass's future, where you see like Dan Aykroyd's <laughs> haunches for the first time. And you're like, he's got kind of a big ass. And knowing what we know now, it's like, oh, he's got a real big ass. It's... <laughs> this was just, this was like before you hydrated it. Joe Friday is a real Fox News kind of guy. American exceptionalism, individual responsibility, red meat, six pack, second amendment. Everybody knows their place. And if you don't, Joe Friday will show it to you. And if not, he'll show you the exit to this great land of ours, buddy. And at some point when he's addressing you, when he thinks you're wrong, he's going to slip in a mister. A, a, that, bub. a bub or a mister. Yeah. As he marches in into the police station we get the actual titles which is like a big badge and flashing colors and lights and close-ups and a remix of the original dragnet theme by a band called the art of noise which is the most 80s thing a band can be called it is almost about 
Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. It's awful. This is that moment in the movie where you're like, oh, I've made a terrible mistake. Like, honey, can we, we could leave across the hall. We're like, it's like 20 minutes. It just started. We could, what? I don't even know what the movie is showing over there, but it's going to be better than this. I think it's the journey of Natty Gan. I heard that was good. It's Pippi Longstocking. I, I don't even know what. <laughs> it's the new adventures of Pippi Longstockings. I heard it was a delight. Light. <laughs> and these opening credits waste our time as they normally do. Normally, I'm the defender here where I'm like, look, these are hardworking people. They deserve for their work to be seen. <sighs> This is Dragnet, people. You throw up the badge, you say Dragnet, you play the remix for 12 seconds. Let's get to the actual meat of this movie. The whole open of this film doesn't matter. It just allows those perpetually late assholes of the world that can't get to a movie theater on time a little extra wiggle room to get their asses in the seats before the movie begins proper. Nothing you saw mattered up until this point. And then we hear this narrator that says, Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent which is 100 percent bullshit this is only here because this is what they would do in the tv show yeah. and presumably the writers of the dragnet tv show that they would just look through the paper and see a story that says hippies on lsd and they're like hey we got an episode and you're like knife fight in an all girls school there's another episode nazis stole a bunch of dynamite and they're gonna commit hate crimes that's the season finale this stuff writes itself people boy if there's one thing i can't stand it's when nazis get their hands on dynamite well this will <laughs> blow you away you're about to go downtown not one frame of this movie is anywhere close to being based on actual events. And then the narrator does this thing that's really unusual and says all of the names have been changed. For example, George Baker is now called Sylvia Wiss. Right. Now, we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Yes, that is almost entirely an Alan's Wybell joke. But it is so disruptive in the flow of the movie uh -huh. that if you come in and try to apply a little bit of like deconstructive back to the future logic, the whole movie falls apart just because of this one line. But then you have to start to wonder like, what is the, the true nature of the magazines that Jerry Caesar is publishing? They're homosexual pornography. Yes. That's what they are. <laughs> yeah. I never looked at gift horth in the mouth. <laughs> When you hear this line, it feels like a throwaway. It, I remember seeing this movie in the theater uh -huh. and thinking, oh, this is going to be kind of like the naked gun. That the movie is sort of winking at the audience. We're all in on the joke. We're going to have a good time. You know what? Just get ready for a little meta humor. And quite honestly, you can unfasten your seatbelts because this movie is not going to go off-roading at all. No, just a little bit of goofery is all. Once we <laughs> set up this joke that's going to pay off frustratingly later, we open on some firemen at this warehouse where it's Caesar Publishing. It's their warehouse, which includes, Chad, as we see on the side of a building, such magazines as Bait, mm -hmm. Field and Cream, yep. and Cable Girls. So Bait is probably in reference to jailbait, right? Like a <laughs> euphemism for young girls with whom sexual contact would land a sutor in jail due to various statutory rape laws. I read it as naked models with stuffed animal predators, like bears and jackals, <laughs> hyenas. Okay, that's what you're into. Great. It's what I want, Chad. What did you think Field and Cream was? Just a spinoff of that, but more for the outdoorsman who enjoys magic? masturbating out in nature or something what is known as bareback milking chad it's <laughs> jesus christ it's just milking a cow with a pail in a field these are naked women but oh never mind oh what was cable girls cable girls are just girls dressed as cable repair or installation people who show up naked to your house is how i read that one i'm thinking maybe roger ailes saw this movie and he thought what if cable girls <laughs> what about a network that hired only women suitable for pornography in magazines that could be published that men could look at and see everything and what if we only showed news that was honest and christian that men like joe friday would enjoy it would be a sensation on cable news what if the women who reported the news had hair as blonde as their dresses were red the kind of network that would make Rumpelstiltskin himself pass out from ecstasy just looking at their locks. Whose morals were as big as their boobs. <laughs> Outside this warehouse of pornography, there's all these fire trucks. It's not like the kind of trucks that are there to put out fires. These look like bread delivery trucks that are just painted red to be part of the fire brigade. And there's a bunch of firemen and they're just loading boxes of pornography into the backs of these trucks. As saxophone players. <laughs> 
the music plays. Dude. This soundtrack, it just looked at, hey, what was the Beverly Hills Cop soundtrack and how do we do that shit here? Get me the guy from Lethal Weapon. Yeah, they got Harold Fartemeyer. <laughs> <laughs> They're stealing this porn in these Tonka truck fire trucks. Right. Here's a scene that's never going to happen in the world after the internet because ain't nobody going to warehouses for porn anymore. Mm-mm. It's right here as I talk to you, Chad, on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's how I record. It's how I relax. So a cop shows up and is like, hey. He's a night security guard. And it's like, hey, it seems weird that all these dudes who look more like boxers than firemen are just dumping gasoline everywhere and carrying boxes of shit out of this warehouse. Mm -hmm. So he goes to ask the head firefighter, one presumes. Who you know how you can tell he's a head firefighter? Because <laughs> he's the biggest one with the bushiest mustache. That's what I was going to say. He's the tallest. Like, that's how they maintain. <laughs> order in the firehouse is everybody lines up at the beginning of the day you're in charge mm -hmm. and it's jack o'halloran who was the third bad guy in the original superman movie and the sequel superman 2 his name was non was that his name was it i think and he, he was also joe perko in that 1976 remake of king kong that we featured on this very podcast he played kong yes <laughs> no he didn't oh i'm sorry <laughs> no he played jeff bridges which was an amazing performance kong was played by <laughs> rick baker yeah yeah kong yeah, yeah. was played by rick baker That's jack right. o'halloran played jeff bridges so jack o'halloran he's the police chief in this most famous for superman 2 even though neither of us can remember what his name was in that movie it's but not i'm sure you're right it was just like he was the dumb one you know in this film he is playing emil muzz is his name which is one of the greatest villain names that's ever been in a movie sounds like a dick tracy villain he looks like a dick tracy villain so the cop is like hey pal what are you doing uh where's the fire get your damn hands off that porno <laughs> And Emil Muzz says, where's the fire? Right here. And then pulls a Molotov cocktail out of his fire coat like Captain Caveman. Mm -hmm. And then just <laughs> throws it into the warehouse. Yep. And then, then Chad, exp explain this to me. He knocks out the guard and then says, I got a message for Jerry Caesar. And it's like, wait, <laughs> you just knocked out your messenger. This is all wasted <laughs> oxygen. This place is burning up like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And he's looking at his scribbled notes on his hand and he can't remember should he read the left hand first or the right hand first it's like give him warning message knock him out i'm just enjoying the reference to one of history's greatest american tragedies <laughs> of this warehouse fire our factory fire that killed children <laughs> children chad it's a comedy show we're doing. It's history, Bo. Yeah. I don't care how many statues of emo muzz you're going to tear down. <laughs> you cannot erase what happened. Edutainment is what I've said the show is for some time. And no, no time like the present. <laughs> you will learn about a factory fire on this program. So after, after he knocks out this guy and says, like, tell Jerry Caesar he's out of business, which is a real backwards way of going about all this. Then he gives the world's worst grin that that has ever happened on film and tosses down a, a card that has the name pagan on it the camera holds on his face while he smiles for about a second and a half longer than it should and i know that doesn't seem like a long period of time but he's grinning and nodding like for two more head bounces than what the editor should have allowed and when he drops these cards, it says pagan and there's a goat head symbol on it. You know, worshiping the devil was kind of a big thing in pop culture in the 80s, kind of going into the 90s. It was starting to fade out here. Hey, Bo, this movie looks like shit, by the way. <laughs> it, it, it looks like a TV movie. It, My next note is it looks like it was shot on a TV show budget. <laughs> this movie looks like garbage. To, to think that this movie <laughs> came after Ghostbusters. Like, how did Dan Aykroyd not look at a daily and be like, nope. They don't look like that. I've seen movies and they don't look like that. That looks like television. Why is there a live studio audience here? Don't get me wrong. I appreciate the craft services. <laughs> a real tight ship they run with the wheat thins and the crackers. In the very next scene, this movie makes a decision that is inexcusable, in my opinion, in how it executes the narrative of this story. So we're in Los Angeles and we're at the city hall and Joe Friday says, it was a Wednesday, January 7th. A cool breeze was blowing from the Southwest at 17 miles per hour. 
hour. And, you know, Aykroyd's doing this Jack Webb impression, which is pretty good, I guess. I don't know who the hell else was doing a Jack Webb impression. And then Joe Friday goes on to say that um, he still occupies the same desk that his uncle Joe Friday used when he was a sergeant. And at this point, this movie became Son of Mask or Ace Ventura Jr. or Disney's The Descendants. It is not necessary for Joe Friday to be genetically related to the original Joe Friday. So would he just be in the this universe the original Joe Friday? Yeah, you just make him a straight lace joke stick. He's just he's Joe Friday doing the impression. Fred Flintstone wasn't the great nephew of Neanderthal Fred Flintstone. I don't need this 23 and me connection for audiences to believe that this movie has created a universe where Joe Friday must have direct lineage to the TV show. You know, I don't have a big problem with that. I think it makes as much sense as anything. It doesn't make make any sense that he <laughs> looks like his uncle he acts like his uncle he sits at the same desk at his uncle unless the original joe friday was actually his biological father which holy shit if that's the case maybe joe friday was fucking this guy's mom and then she had the baby and she's like oh joe friday is your uncle maybe you could grow up and be a police officer just like your father i mean your uncle oh. yes yeah, sir mom used to send me out of the room when <laughs> uncle joe would come over oh Oh, oh, oh. Your mother really loves you. <laughs> yes, sir. She does. Huh, huh, huh. Now that makes more sense. <laughs> I like this movie more already. When he comes in, Joe Friday has has noted the desk of his partner, Frank Smith. And it's like, hey, my, my shithead partner hasn't shown up and he's got a shitty desk. And th this is where Harry Morgan as Frank Gannon, Captain Gannon in this film, shows up and is like, hey, Frank's not going to be in today, Joe. And there's a whole gag about like, oh, 24 hour flu. And he's like, no, he's not going to be in tomorrow either. 48. Uh, which is fine. It's a, it's a good little joke. Yeah. Nice little shot across the bow joke. Not a knee slapper, but uh, it's it's amusing. Then he's like, no, there was this goat farm that Frank Smith always wanted. And that's what he's done. He's left. It was too painful to talk to Joe and tell him that he was quitting. So he just left him this note. Joe Freddy says, yeah, everyone's got a dream. And that goat farm was his. I understand that, Captain. But what about the people of Los Angeles? The 3.6 million people who are expecting him to be on the job today you think they'll understand is joe friday autistic that's kind of the thing like that's how he's presented in this film as being if not autistic a little touch of like asperger's or something where he's totally functional but just completely obsessed with being a carbon copy of his uncle how does captain gannon respond to that could you imagine that there's this nephew wink wink of your former partner who looks like him dresses like him has a black and white photo of him on his desk he brings him up all the time like fucking norman bates's mother he's like how, how would your uncle feel about your behavior right now joe captain gannon knows that jack webb he took care of business even if that's not the case, how would you deal with this type of bizarre imitation of a dead relative? I get that Jim Belushi made a whole career of it, and Joaquin Phoenix, you know, kind of did too, but Joe Friday? He should be bounced right out of this station. And then he goes to meet his new partner, Chad. Mm -hmm. And now, here's one of my problems with the movie, is it seems like Joe Friday is presented as the ridiculous character of the film. Yes. And then you go to this scene where he he is introduced to Tom Hanks, who plays Pep Strebeck, mm -hmm. is his name in this movie. That name's ridiculous, Bo. He enters like Jack Sparrow in a car being towed, yeah. where like the door falls off and he's dressed like he's homeless. And there's a whole scene where Tom Hanks is like, hey, I'll be a new partner. Not looking like that, you aren't. There's a dress code for detectives in robbery and homicide. Section 3-105.10.22.25.256. It specifies a clean shirt, short hair, tie, press trousers, sport jacket or suit leather shoes with a high shine on them and then we immediately cut to sometime in the very near future where strebeck has taken a shower and put on clothes to where he could go be a substitute teacher or maybe the cool assistant principal who plays drums in a band on the weekend friday gives some voiceover he's like strebeck cleaned up his act and for the first time i was rolling onto the streets with a new partner by my side and then strebeck does that mid-air jerk off hand motion behind joe friday the what i call yeah is your order right on the screen motion the pairing of these two actors and their respective characters doesn't really make sense 
to your point, Strebeck is the wild card. He's kind of the out of control partner, your rigs, if you will. Mm -hmm. Whereas Friday is the straight laced by the books cop or your Murtaugh to complete the analogy. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more, but it doesn't seem to make sense that you have these two characters of the wild card and the straight arrow, but their behavior is such that it doesn't really align. Like, for example, Joe Friday smokes cigarettes. It would make a little more sense, in my opinion, for Strebeck to be the smoker. There are things about their dietary habits or their sexual proclivity that doesn't really align when you start to interchange these characteristics across by the books and sort of operating outside of the norms of police work or just society in general. The problem is you've got two clowns and no straight men in this movie. And as we learn from Wild Wild West, that does not work. Right. Keeping with a theme of both not enough straight men and also rap music to close out a film, the two films are tied in, in more ways than one. <laughs> a decade plus apart. It's a real, like, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it scenario. There's some narration about how Pep has to be a good cop, despite how he looked. The fact that he carried a badge meant he deserved my respect. The Los Angeles Police Department deigned that he was worthy to be a detective and therefore worthy of my admiration. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but we like Strebeck more than we like Joe Friday. Joe Friday looks like a kind of guy who's got corpses of missing hookers and rotting dead dogs in the crawl space of his house. Because when Strebeck gets into his patrol car, he's like commenting on his height and his weight and all of the interesting things that Joe Friday has learned about his new partner after doing a background check on him. Joe right. Friday is a fucking weirdo, man. He was six feet tall, 165 pounds. If you x-rayed him just right you could see the last thing he ate was a uh, two plates of sushi spring rolls also a california spicy roll he dresses to the left boxers not briefs also a tangier smell than you'd expect as they're driving around strebeck is eating rice cake patties so he's kind of health conscious in this movie a little more on that later and listening to a walkman too like bopping along and hey he's doing tom hanks from that period of time like, oh, oh, oh. right it's the oh paprika i'm the happiest spice in the world <laughs> like it is that tom hanks which is a great tom hanks to have in your movie well depending upon which movie you're making right you need his partner to be straight laced but not with asperger's A sociopathic <laughs> <laughs> like serial killer yeah and so the joke here is that joe friday is driving super slow and hanks is like you know joe you can speed up friday's like maybe this is all greek to you mister but do you ever think that driving seven miles below the speed limit saves the taxpayers of los angeles eight cents a mile and he's like yeah this just looks bad man <laughs> like we look like assholes and so they arrive at the <laughs> zoo and there's more joe friday lines about like you know street back these animals have it pretty good simulated surroundings three squares a day these creatures could talk they'd give the citizens of the city a big thanks i'm like you know what i think that that's how joe friday frames up all of the people that he's put in jail you know it's, <laughs> right. it's really better for them on the inside they're making friends learning a trade having lots of sexual intercourse occasionally consensual if you're into that kind of thing which i'm not stop looking at me like that have you ever considered that privatizing jails creates jobs the more of these <laughs> felons we put away boards more money in the pocket it's Uncle Sam. If only there was a news channel that would present this type of information to the American people. They would just report and we would decide. Welcome to the Friday Factor. You want the news? I'm giving you <laughs> just the facts, man. Can you believe these people telling President Trump he needs to wear a mask? Not on my watch, mister. <laughs> The president doesn't hide for nothing, not even a virus. Dennis Miller saw this movie. Hey, babe, I got an idea for a show. Yeah. <laughs> More on him later. Yeah, yeah, spoilers. Um, <laughs> the zookeeper takes them over to this boa constrictor enclosure where a snake has gone missing, and then they go over to a fruit tree where a bat was stolen, and lastly, they go over to the lion enclosure where the robbers stole a lion's mane, but left the lion with a mohawk. But in reality, Bo, this is just a female lion, and the filmmakers slapped a fake mohawk hawk on top of its head <laughs> right. and i think this is supposed to be a joke luckily tom hanks is here and his performance as strebeck occasionally will surprise you with a genuine chuckle and one happens in this scene <laughs> so joe friday is like look at that whatever pervert did that is ruining lions forever for these children you think any of these kids are ever going to want to come to a zoo and look at a lion again strebeck friday don't worry the lion's mane's going to grow back yeah well how are those kids going to know that kids it'll grow back yay, yay! 
<laughs> and that is Dragnet Theater by Pick Six Movies. But Tom Hanks saves the day. When he, when he just his casual, offhanded remark, I'm like, this is idiotic. What yeah. am I doing here? How much am I getting paid? It's a like, funny delivery because, like, both of them are trying in this movie, and that's part of the problem is that you have two comedic <laughs> actors both, like, jockeying for the joke in the scene. There's the old story, Chad, about when Yul Brenner and Steve McQueen were on the set of Magnificent Seven. Mm hmm. And you can see this on film. Both of them personally and their agents fought about who was the star of the movie. Like, Steve McQueen was on the way up, Yul Brynner was kind of on the way down, but both of them wanted the name above the title kind of thing. Sounds like Penny Marshall and Cindy Williams, but go on. If you watch Magnificent Seven, any scene where you see Yul Brynner delivering a line and Steve McQueen is also in the scene, he is kicking his boot, he's picking his teeth, he is doing anything he can to draw his eye to you <laughs> instead of Yul Brynner. It's been years since I've seen that, but now I have a reason to go back and watch it again. It, it's an amazing movie, not for the least reason that it features one of the greatest full film fuck yous of cinema. Go on, you'll we're all interested in what you're saying, I guess. But it's the same kind of thing here where you just got two actors in a scene both trying to be the star of that scene. And I don't think it's their fault. I think it's just how the characters are written. You saying that reminded me of a documentary I saw years ago called The Celluloid Closet. It was like the history of homosexuality and cinema. And at that time, the documentary ended with Philadelphia, talking about Tom Hanks. But in it, there was an examination of Ben-Hur, where Charlton Heston, playing Ben-Hur, when he comes back from battling overseas, he embraces his friend, whose character I cannot remember the name of. It's a scene where they throw the spears and they hit the exact same point up on the cross bars and they came to Charlton Heston and said hey when you come back you're going to embrace your friend and the two of you had previously been lovers and so when you come back here and he's like it's like whoa 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 we were what <laughs> like well yeah you were lovers at the time you had had a, a romantic physical I'm not doing that who do you think you're talking to get your hands off and so when you watch the scene the actor who is playing against him is playing it as though they had been lovers whereas charlton heston is just walking around leading with his chin checking out all of the sexy female extras that are around but understanding that context of what's going on is always fascinating in cinema history yes daryl i see you i'm not ignoring <laughs> you no i knew him in college it was you know i <laughs> We roomed together for a little while. It's it's nothing, really. Yo, no, Daryl. We'll definitely get coffee sometime. We'll talk all about how we knew each other back then. Friday narrates that arsonist posing as Los Angeles City fireman left a pagan card at a burned-down warehouse. We were advised to contact the owner of the stolen merchandise, softcore porno Lord Jerry Caesar, at his notorious pleasure compound in the coveted Bel Air section of the city. Let me tell you one of my favorite jokes in this whole movie. Because it's, it's really dumb but i really like it when they drive up to this place it's got one of those speakers like the the old school 80 speakers you hit the button mm -hmm. and they're like yes except the way that the ladies of bait magazine answer the buzz at the gate is thank god vibrator repair a well, couple of questions one is vibrator repair a real job mobile vibrator repair chad not even just like hey we got to send it into the manufacturer we got mobile vans strolling up do you learn that at a trade school <laughs> you have to apprentice to a master vibrator repairman who will show you the ins and outs of, of the business <laughs> whoa 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 slow down buddy you're gonna start out on rubber dildos you're not <laughs> jumping right to the vibrators hey you come in here acting like you own the place now look if you're lucky if you're lucky the rare few will graduate up to pocket pussies but i got can't make any he promises there all right look i've seen some of the best wash out and spend their lives repairing fleshlights <laughs> is that how you want to end up kid does joe friday look like a vibrator repairman in this film uh, but i don't think they could see him i think it's just a voice thing i don't think there's like a closed circuit camera if i was a vibrator repairman mm -hmm. i would get my hands on one of those uncommissioned oscar meyer wiener mobiles and like give it a fresh paint job and call it like down there pleasure repair I would call mine Resurrection. Resurrection. Oh, that's even better. Resurrection vibrator repair. See you later, broken vibrator. Wink, wink. We'll have it repaired in three days. Then you just go buy a new one, charge them twice as much. Uh-huh. Hallelujah, my vibrator is repaired, says the ad. Then you sell the old used ones to some guy who can make a buck or two over in some Asian country. You got, you're making money coming and going. Yeah. Pun intended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're selling the new ones on a 
markup to the ladies. You repair the busted ones. You sell those to the real doll weirdos. <laughs> like in the fact that it's used is a selling point. No, no, no. This thing's, it's got quite a few miles on it. Not so gently used if you get my drift. <laughs> Smell this. Blah. Yeah. I'll take three. This one comes with a certificate. Friday and Strebeck, they roll onto this compound, and there are all of these lovely young women in khaki shorts and white tank tops and tan ball caps and no bras, and they're working in the gardens that's all full of naked statuary, like some of them in sexual embrace, and it's all accompanied by even more 1980s sexy saxophone music. It's like if at the Playboy Mansion, all the playmates had to earn their keep. Yeah. You know, where it's like you got to go prune bushes or do landscaping or cook or something. You're not just laying around. Saxophones are the instrument of sexy time, right? Or at least in the 80s. And banjos were the instruments of incest. And harmonicas were the instruments that bridged sentences when you were telling the story of why you had the blues. And then xylophones were the instruments of sneaking skeletons. And then tubas were for when fat people were walking around. That all tracks. Okay. And the bassoon, I think, was the wolf. They roll up into Jerry Caesar's bait pad. Thank God. And get to one of the best things about this movie. It's a girl coming out of the building or the compound, <laughs> the, the the sex compound. Tom Hanks is like, hey, I know who you are. And Joe Friday belches out a plume of smoke that looks like he's trying to win a vaping contest. It's just blinding. <laughs> Right, where he's like, you're Miss April, and you like bobbing for apples, which is weird, but you don't like smoky, well, what is it that you don't like? And she's like, smokers, and she takes the cigarette out of Joe Friday's mouth. Then she's like, hey, let me take you to Jerry. Then they point to Dabney Coleman. Dabney Coleman, for those who don't know, he is the walking, talking embodiment of a scumbag. I'm sure he's a lovely guy, but he plays no, an asshole. No, I don't think he is. God rest his soul if he's dead. He's not. <laughs> Who's a bigger prick, Dabney Coleman or Ted Knight? Oh, man. I mean, you're right in the high country. <laughs> it's Dabney it's, Coleman. It's Dabney Coleman because even in his sitcom, at least in Too Close for Comfort, Ted Knight was kind of friendly. Whereas in Buffalo Bill, the Dabney Coleman sitcom, he also just played an asshole. What about Dabney Coleman and Alan Rickman? Oh, uh, Dabney Coleman for sure. Alan Rickman starred in romantic comedies and was actually compelling and good in them. And believable. What about Dabney Coleman against William Atherton? Peck from Ghostbusters. Uh, and Real Genius. Yeah, yeah. Coleman, Dabney Coleman. yeah, Dabney Coleman because he, <laughs> cause he'll stab you in an alley. Like Atherton <laughs> will be sarcastic and make you feel bad, but Coleman, push come to shove, he'll get you in the liver so he'll see the dark blood. If you were to say to Dabney Coleman, you didn't say pretty please, he's going to kick you in the dick. Yes, yes. He's not going to look at you and go, would you please turn off? <laughs> he would light a cigar <laughs> off of your burning corpse. <laughs> and then put it out on your cheek. Uh-huh. Guess who's got the upper hand now? <laughs> um, but all right, so here's the thing. So let, let's get to the best let's character in the movie. So Jerry Caesar is Dabney Coleman, who's amazing. And, and really the movie Odyssey is nine to five because he's incredible in that. But take your time here. Spend as much time with this scene as you want because he's <laughs> laying by the pool. There's 25 bikini clad women everywhere. Amazing wraparound sunglasses flanked by babes in lounge chairs. He's got a full body robe as he is sunbathing. Yes. His full chair has a yellow and white white tiger stripe fur throw underneath him i don't know if i noticed that <laughs> so they show up and they're like we heard your warehouse got robbed and he's like yeah the 25th anniversary of bait magazine he has the greatest lisp in cinema history since leon phelps the ladies man i think that tim meadows may have been inspired by dabney coleman's performance in creating leon phelps he kind of pitches his voice high and he has a lisp but it doesn't sound gay it's like an octave below mike tyson right Right. It's not like he's doing a caricature. He's just no. a dude who talks this way. It's about time I called you cops about three hours ago. Yeah. Just because I wouldn't print their manifesto. They went and stole yeah. my magazine. <laughs> Joe Friday says, could you describe what's missing? And Jerry Caesar says, uh, yeah, how about the entire run? That is every single copy of the 25th anniversary double issue of Beat Magazine. When Joe Friday asks him, how much is the run worth? Jerry Caesar's response is, 
Unless you stay in it more than you'll ever see in your whole life. And I do that every month. So before you rush back to your little apartment and start polishing your pennies, why don't you get out there and find my magazines? At one point, Strebeck tells Friday, he's like, Bates a magazine. Friday's like, yeah, I know that. And Jerry Caesar says, you say the intelligence subscriber described it as a politically oriented, socially impacting monthly. <laughs> and I'm not going to be bullied around by some cement heads because I refuse to publish their stupid manifesto. This wraps up with Joe Friday saying, listen, hotshot, I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't care for you or the putrid sludge you're troweling out, but until they change the laws and put you sleaze kings out of business, my job is to help you get your stench ridden boxes of smut back. And since I'll be doing it holding my nose, I'll be doing it with one hand. That's when Strebeck needs to make his jerk off motion. <laughs> but here's the thing. I like that this character in this movie is so uncompromisingly out of time and place. Like, does it make sense? No. But I like the fact that he is Jack Webb from Dragnet. And I think Ackroyd does an amazing job of kind of channeling that character. And when he kind of gets in Dabney Coleman's face, like this scene is what the whole movie should be. Jerry Caesar retorts, my publishing company is a private enterprise and not a a platform for any yahoo to publish whatever they want i don't care how many copies they buy just because they have first amendment rights that don't mean i have to publish the junk i got first amendment rights too look him up friday and i'm like dude he's right jerry caesar softcore porno king and amateur constitutionalist yeah and of course friday's response is i don't need to look him up i can quote him to you pal and again that's why i like <laughs> dan Aykroyd in this role is that he is just he is just that dude like he inhabits that character you put dabney coleman doing his character and Dan Aykroyd doing his character in a movie where you have another straight man and you got yourself a great film. Which is also funny because at the end of the movie, spoilers, Dabney Coleman turns out to be the good guy or a good guy. He hasn't done anything wrong. In fact, he's donating money to charity. And he's running a business. He is a co-conspirator. He's kind of along for the ride at least. He's a businessman. <laughs> I also want to point out that during this whole scene by the pool, there's a half empty bottle of Miller Genuine Draft <laughs> sitting on the table behind Jerry Caesar. Yeah, then the champagne of beer. <laughs> I really like that it's there just to give more color to Jerry Caesar. Or honestly, I think that maybe a member of the crew forgot it was there when they were doing a light check before filming. Either way, I'm good with that. We also haven't pointed out what was going on with Pep Strebeck while Joe Friday and Jerry Caesar are having their little tete-a-tete. One of these bait mates, as they call them, is sitting there licking her lips and sticking her tongue in and out. And he's like making kissy suck faces with her as well and i don't know as an audience member how i'm supposed to feel about this like does that make him seem more like a cad does it make him seem more endearing it's strange to see tom hanks making crude sexual advances to a woman who's probably 16 what's a year or two yeah he's probably a sex addict in this movie given the number of times it's just like peb strebeck was once again making friends with some of our sisters in law enforcement by once again having a one night affair that does nothing to fill the hole inside him because his mother left about this time an older woman and she looks like she's in her 40s she comes over and reminds jerry caesar that he has a collagen treatment and he's also going to get his pores sucked at three o'clock and bo that's code for something else but it's not what you think Oh, is it a blowjob? No. It's not what I think then. <laughs> but she compliments Joe Friday. You're a good looking man. You've got really big hands. Then she says, hey, what do you think of these? And then flashes her tits. Not that you say them or anything. This is all relatively PG film. Mm -hmm. And he just freezes like his eyes lock on him like real deer in headlights. Dude, he doesn't waver. He doesn't look away. <laughs> Conversely, Pep Strebeck, he does a quick double take and then sort of shifts his head in embarrassment the way most normal heterosexual men on planet earth would react right it's the seinfeld you get a sense of them and you look away now we got to point out that pep strebeck recognizes this woman as sylvia wiss yes who as the narrator told us at the beginning of the film had her character's name changed from george baker that's right so this means that in the reality that this is based on george baker walked up to the equivalent of joe friday and flashed his cock yeah. is that what happened <laughs> Hey, take a look at this thing. You got big hands there. Hey, does this look like the cock of a 43-year-old man? 
No, it doesn't look like the cock of a 43-year-old man. In fact, it's quite impressive, bordering on spectacular. <laughs> and Hanks is like, hey, I think I left my uh, <laughs> notebook in the car, and uh, you and Miss Wiss can uh, talk some more. <laughs> and then he takes off. Joe Friday is like, sorry, Miss Wiss, gotta go. Hey, where are you going? We were just going to party. We are going to have a, a good time. I got more genuine high life in the coolers. No ice in it, but they were cold when I bought them. They're probably still a little bit cold. No, sir. I'm getting back to work. Do you have $20 that I could hold for a little bit? I'm calling the police. <laughs> and then Tom Hanks is like, hey, she wanted to have sex with you. And Joe Friday is like, let's go find that notebook you lost, Strebeck. Hey, I didn't lose a notebook. I was trying to get out of here so that you could have sex with that man woman. Look, I'm just a little confused right now is all. Let's go get some lunch. And so that's what they do. They go get some lunch. And it's uh, one of those fish out of water things where it's like, Hanks is eating this plate of fruit. But it, again, it's like one person should be having just a sandwich and the other person should be having something crazy not hey here's an entire plate of fruit and then here's friday having chili dogs why wouldn't friday be eating the nutritious food and strebeck is the slob who's eating the bad food and then friday is telling him that food is not good for you because what happens here is that strebeck is like hey those things are full of nitrates and band-aids and rat guts you know what's in that you need to eat more healthy and show friday is like look between the <laughs> cigarettes this is the only advice i have so how about you back the fuck off pal I don't think so. Let's get a couple of canines to sniff around wherever the hell you live. You're <laughs> not going to have to be there too long, and you're going to be in the backseat of a patrol car, you weirdo. Look, nobody goes into mother's room. And Strebeck is eating the fruit plate with chopsticks. Yeah. Well, this just looks a little weird. Yes. You can use your fingers, a plastic fork of some kind. You don't need chopsticks, unless he just had his own, and I don't think that was the case. If Strebeck is meant to be this hippy-dippy, healthy, new-age California cop, I almost feel like that the two of them shouldn't be the same age, and they clearly look they're within like two, three years of one another. And Strebeck should be played by somebody younger, or you have Joe Friday, who arguably should be older yeah and you also can't tag strebeck with all of the creepy sex behavior and his rain man level of retention when it comes to bait mates do's and don'ts and then also have him be like my body is a temple but i'll fuck anything that moves it's all mixed up <laughs> as 311 pointed out chad it's all mixed up and don't know what to do as they're having this conversation about bug excrement and the chili dogs behind them their police cars being stolen a la the movie running scared a far superior buddy cop movie yeah, that is not a movie we will ever talk about on this show, only in passing. Because it's too good, is what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, Adam Robertson. Ding. Captain. I, I, look, I can pretty much do that movie from memory. Call it all cars. Call it all cars. It's UFO on Michigan Avenue. Look, he's got these really <laughs> cheese ball lo locks up here. You can just push right in. Again, he's got this briefcase full of money right here. <laughs> That's a really good movie. How that never got a sequel is beyond me. I run into way too many people who just aren't familiar with that movie at all. And that blows my mind. It's one of those movies I'm like, how did you not watch this 30 times? And every time you were like, you know what? Maybe there is one too many Michael McDonald songs in this. But that's really the biggest flaw. <laughs> I think it's you. Usually because Running Scared was sitting on the shelf next to that Pat Morita, Jay Leno, buddy cop shit sure. fest. It, you're like, you're like, yeah, I'm not watching this. Yeah. Right. But one of those has talented Billy people. Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines? Right. R really? Jimmy Smith is the bad guy? What? But it's also Peter Hyams directing it. Joey Pants is comic relief? <laughs> right. Yeah. They couldn't get Joe Pesci? Snake, could you be any dumber? <laughs> what movie are we talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. Drag that. So anyway, <laughs> back at the station after their car is stolen, Joe Friday is given and Tom Hanks real dressing down for leaving the keys in the car. And then Captain Stupid. <laughs> Captain Gaddick calls him in and is like, hey, I need you guys to investigate a chemical theft. Uh, he's like, you need to be careful out there, by the way, because these pagan guys are stealing cop cars and yeah, fire yeah, trucks. Yeah, yeah. Captain. <laughs> and so they get a Ford subcompact is their new car. Mm -hmm. And they go to question the engineer about this theft of, of stolen gas and yep. where they found a pagan car left behind and the thing that i like about this is the use of the phrase pseudo hallucinogenic compound cyanosin it's one of those gags that it's just funny to hear somebody
somebody say that in this way. The owner of the rail line or tanker or whatever is like, yeah, they stole this drug and also the pseudo-hallucinogenic compound cyanosin. And Joe Friday goes, pseudo-hallucinogenic compound cyanosin. Uh-huh. And it's a funny gag. Owner of the chemical company is Peter Leeds, who played George the Drunk on the original Dragnet TV show. Yeah. Remember when town drunks were a stock character on TV shows? That was a simpler time, wasn't it? It all goes back to Otis from yeah. the Andy Griffith <laughs> show who had the key to his own cell and would just let him foster brooks okay <laughs> he's a stand-up comedian who's a raging alcoholic you mean dean martin no foster brook it's a character yeah that's right it's a character <laughs> like the movie lenny <laughs> it's all make em ups the chemical plant owner says if you mix these chemicals together it makes a fertilizer that's also deadly to breathe hey kind of like your aftershave huh says tom hanks you're just like oh just settle down yeah. bub you're crossing a line there my mother gave this to me she said it was my father's favorite scent i never met him never what you're smelling is a scrap of flesh that came from my nana i <laughs> keep it in the breast pocket of this jacket mister we cut to joe friday and pep strebeck and they're at this magazine stand out on the streets and joe friday he picks up a copy of a magazine called moral american companion but let me point out that when he picks up this magazine it's under this long drawn out chain and it is directly next to all of the male nude pornography including magazines called jock play guy and inches all featuring george <laughs> baker on the covers <laughs> on a kawasaki motorcycle bending over <laughs> george baker shows it all i think that joe friday's magazine of choice moral american companion was one of those periodicals for repressed men in the 80s that just couldn't come out as being gay because america just kept them in the closet but you know you kind of pick it up and thumb through it and it's full of a bunch of homosexual vampire erotica and other fantasy fiction that allows some sort of a release because society at large denied them the opportunity to live the life you truly want to lead Oh, look, this month, it's a bunch of college boys holding rifles. Mm. That's inspiring. Volleyball, the new rage across the Navy and the Air Force. <laughs> That's going to end badly. Hmm. This is just a printout of the lyrics to playing with the boys. Seems like a good ditty. <laughs> hmm. A full page ad from Iceman to Maverick. I really dig what you're putting down. Sounds like a future episode. A full interview with George Michael. I definitely want to read that. Hope he can someday find a lovely woman to settle down with. Maybe he can get out of the shadow of that other guy from Wham. Send your emails to Bo Ransby. <laughs> Pick six movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All protest goes to me. <laughs> but the whole point of this scene ultimately is that on the TV at this bodega, there's the Christopher Plummer. Welcome to the movie. I think of him as the Klingon from Star Trek VI, which is, for my money, the second best Star Trek movie. He's been in a million things. Like Christopher Plummer's an incredibly famous and accomplished actor. But in this case, he is the Reverend Whirly, mm -hmm. and he is a local minister. Is this like a public access show that he's hosting? Is that what your read on this was? Or like a syndicated thing locally or something. I don't know that it's okay. full. We're going to show up here at the studio and put on a show, everyone. <laughs> he's got an organization called MAMA. It's M-A-M-A, -M -A, the Moral Advanced Movement of America. Yeah. So you have an acronym called MAMA, and the mysterious group is called Pagan. This is a real mystery incorporated type of a clue we got here Bo and he's doing some interview with the commissioner of yeah. police Jane Kirkpatrick is the character's name yeah and what we learn is that Joe Friday is a big fan of the Reverend Worley here Pep Strebeck says hey you seen this guy <laughs> what a middle furball and then not surprisingly Joe Friday says this happens to be one of my favorite shows because Joe Friday is just what some social and sexual misfit who has some deep dark secrets that nobody knows about not even himself he kind of just blacks out and wakes up and cleans up the room and hopes there's no evidence around look when i go home i pour myself a tall glass of distilled water sit myself in the recliner put a pair of clothespins on my nipples and i watch this till i fall asleep bub i shoot up heroin between my toes all 10 of them i do exactly one sixteenth of a gram in between each toe <laughs> it gets me the right kind of high and no one will ever know you know what i mean pep with a name like pep i i know you know what i mean you've chased the dragon haven't you strebeck you've gone to those smoke-filled rooms where all the writing is in some kind of oriental language. <laughs> 
<laughs> Police Commissioner Jane says, What an honor it is to have you choose Los Angeles to be the focal point of your moral advancement for the movement of America, Reverend. That's an eerily good impression. Thank you. This movie came out, as we noted earlier, in 87. So Ronald Reagan was still president. And just a few months prior to this movie's release, Jim Baker, he resigned because he got caught fucking Jessica Hahn. And we're just a few years away from Jimmy Swaggart's sexual scandal. And so this movie was kind of right on the nose about pointing out how religious leaders are more than likely to be up to no good, which is what happens in this movie. Missed the kids thing by about 25 years, which is unfortunate, but all right. They may have missed the target, but at least they hit the tree. Yeah, there's a couple of generations of kids who appreciate that. Reverend Worley says, when you want to make change to the financial markets, you go to New York, and when you want to change politics, you go to D.C. But when you want to tackle pornography, filth, crime, and degradation, you go to Los Angeles. And Police Commissioner Jane, she kind of shakes her head like, hey, look, Bob, you're calling me out. Like, (laughs) you need to fucking pump the brakes on that shit. I got an elected office. So after they watch the TV show, what with the commissioner and Reverend Worley, they go to this shitty motel where these pagan carts were reported, uh-huh. which is run by this angry old lady who I assume is the landlady or she's just her mean neighbor. Hard to say. It's played by Kathleen Freeman, who was Sister Mary Stigmata in the Blues Brothers. <laughs> you think Dan Aykroyd was like, hey, nice to see you again. Here, Here's some <laughs> vodka I'm working on. It's not quite right yet. Danny, it's me, Kathleen. I need work. I really need need work i'll tell you what needs a workout your ability to think for yourself look do you know what's going on at area 51 kathleen have you ever seen a crystal skull i did like when they went to this motel that the swimming pool had been filled with sand to make it either the saddest children's <laughs> playground ever or the world's most awesome litter box it had like a little big wheel in it and a couple of deflated basketballs that made me laugh there are some nice touches here or there if again if the movie didn't look like i hate to use this example given that you know carl reiner just passed away but like the jerk is not a great looking movie and i think you can kind of forgive that for both time and budget whereas this was like a big budget movie it's like this movie looks like it was shot 1978 for twenty thousand dollars yeah you can forgive that i mean clerks doesn't look good but it pulls off what it pulls off this just looks like shit it looks really flat there's no depth to any of the images and stuff i mean that's kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of like just how to shoot a scene well but it just looks bad it looks like an episode of hill street blues it looks like a tv show which maybe they're arguing like like exactly right we were capturing right. the essence of dragnet and putting it on the big screen like no you weren't because explain the car chase in a few minutes well we can't it just looks like shit exactly so as they're questioning this old lady she, she curses a whole lot right like, you pencil dick asshole motherfuckers well she doesn't say motherfucker but she gets close sure and she hands over pagan car and there's a music sting like when you find a clue in Uncharted where ding, ding, ding. yeah it was like hey we got a clue in Dragnet and then she's like I threw that scum sucking slut wallows stuff in the garbage all his magazines gross and she says they stole her wedding dress <laughs> right which is not important but it is eh, it's mentioned you know yeah. Joe Friday is like hey listen I could throw the book at you for n- swearing at cops and she's like hey I didn't have to call anybody down here I I just did it because people like me, I have a hot God damn it. And it's a really good <laughs> God damn it. You know, I'm a fan. I know. And this is a pretty good one. This is a pretty good God damn it. I have a story for the listeners. Do you mean to tell it, Bo? <laughs> if this involves <laughs> elevators, then by all means. So a lot of times I share stories with Bo that he doesn't know about me. And Bo knows a lot of stories about me. There's a story about me and Bo that most people don't know. So as I was moving out of college my final year, I had lived previously with my brother who had a friend who was a real weirdo and he had a box full of real low grade pornography and as I moved from one apartment to another I took it with me and I didn't really want to touch it because the guy was a dirt bag and it was really gross but I thought there may be something funny to do with this so my final semester in college it was just tucked away and Bo helped me move out of my apartment and we found this box of pornography We're like well what can we do with it so as we packed everything up into a van to move away we called both of the elevators down from the 10 story apartment 
apartment building that I lived in, um, put them on hold, and then wallpapered the floors of the elevators with really offensive pornography, and then drove off giggling, knowing that college co-eds would be dinging their way to head back to their apartments, and then they would be repulsed by pornography. Yeah, it was a terrible thing to do. It was so funny. We laughed so hard. I'm glad that we've grown up. <laughs> Is trying to toss the magazines in in such a way that they would kind of flutter open and the real yahtzee was like oh it opened on a like a really graphic deli meat kind of shot it was a moment of like i'm not touching this i'm not touching it well one of us has to touch it i'll touch it if you touch it like, all right as soon as we got done it's like we've got to go wash our hands we had to go through one of those like silkwood fumigation tunnels of somebody <laughs> scrubbing us with a long brush and i just pulled out a lighter and ran it under my fingers trying not to burn off my fingerprints yeah i still can't be printed back to our movie they dig through the trash they find a big thing of trash and they put it on a park bench and they're poking through it and they find a polaroid picture and it's of two women and they're clearly at muscle beach yes and even if you've never been to muscle beach you know they're at muscle beach because the sign behind them you see the last two letters of muscle and the first two letters of beach so i've never been there and i immediately i'm like well that's muscle beach and it's like muscular women in 1980s leotards and they're showing off their giant muscles and they're like hmm this might be a clue bub so they look in the back and there's a phone number which immediately i'm like that is either to get a prostitute to come visit you or to have someone deliver you cocaine it's one or the other or both if you're lucky it's the same service hi i'm amber and here's a huge bag of cocaine that'll be ten thousand dollars i go around the world and at the end of the destination is an eight ball we get a gag where strebeck and joe friday they go payphone to payphone trying to find that'll work and then they eventually find one but there's like eight people lined up to use the phone what i can see one or two people waiting but eight in line are these just friends of the producers like i can get you in the movie just get in that line but then as they continue to look you realize that every other phone within a a mile is busted or not working or cursed by witches or whatever the fuck so it takes them for like and and the gag doesn't go anywhere it's not a great gag and it's one of those moments where you're like this could easily be trimmed this whole thing could go joe friday dials it and the voice that answers is that lady looking for a vibrator repair service and she's like hello is this the vibrator repair man i still need my vibrator repaired he's like i'm joe friday we're looking for emo muzz the bad guy from superman 2 i'm a police officer just take my word for it tell me where he is oh considering he's jerry caesar's driver i guess he's at the pier do you know any vibrator repair men who could come out and repair my vibrator <laughs> what i mean is i can't get off without my vibrator <laughs> and it being in a state of disrepair Makes it very difficult for me to achieve orgasm. That's kind of my thing. No, ma'am. I can't help you. Click. Ring, ring, ring. <laughs> Hello, it's me again. Uh, I was waiting in line to use this phone. A police officer just ran off. Can I help you? Look, I'm in need of a vibrator repairman. Now, I don't know if that's your trade, per se, but you <laughs> seem like an honest soul. If I give you an address, can you try to repair a vibrator? Is this Vincent Price? Click. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> i've been found out it's one of the weirder things we've ever done on this show oh shit so they go to the pier and sure enough there's amel muzz sleeping on the job <laughs> well of course he's a driver what <laughs> he, he ain't driving anywhere what the fuck is he gonna do they go over to him and they're you know there's a gag he's like hey look here's the description from the foul mouth lady big dumb stupid looking perfect match strebeck and so they go over to the window and as soon as they wake him up he's just like fuck you cops and takes off as uh-huh. as a villain would do and he runs over uh, dan Aykroyd's feet who mugs for the camera yeah but it's a pretty good mug in fairness it's a, like if you're going to do a comic face might as well be that one yeah and then hanks drives and there there's a chase around the pier the most notable thing here for me is dan Aykroyd in the jack webb voice saying look out muppets yeah, that makes me laugh. In the subtitles, it's spelled Moppets. Really? Uh-huh. Did they not have the license for the subtitles? But it's okay in the movie? I don't know. I thought it was weird, too. I was like, why did he say Moppet? Look out, unregistered puppets. Comple- <laughs> completely above board, unlicensed, R.I.P. puppets. 
Look out. So they the car chase ends unceremoniously as they crash into a lifeguard stand or something. And so they take Emil Muzz downtown to interrogate him. The best part of all of this is that when he, Emil Muzz crashes into this lifeguard stand, Joe Friday's line is, surf's up, beach boy, but not for you. You'll be hanging ten downtown. It's pretty good. I'm good with that in the movie. Once they go to interrogate him, Emil Muzz hocks a loogie into the face of Joe Friday that is only bested by that kid on Weird Al Yankovic's children's television show halfway through UHF. It's pretty good. Yeah, Hanks ducks out of the way and hits Dan Aykroyd. And this is the point where Tom Hanks is like, hey, Joe, why don't you go get us some coffee? Some coffee? I'm not thirsty. Oh, <laughs> I get it, Streebeck. I'll be back with some wink, wink coffee. I get it. You want to abuse a prisoner without me looking. Thanks, pal. <laughs> Thanks for keeping me out of the investigation. <laughs> <laughs> he, he leaves and Tom Hanks is like, hey, hey, you, you know what's going to be real fun, Amo Muzz? You got a silly name. It's just you and me and your balls in this drawer. And then he just pulls this drawer out and slams it shut. And I guess what's happening is that when he's pulling the drawer out, Amo Muzz's balls are slipping into the open slot. I don't understand the physics of this at all. Furniture physics of this do not make any sense at all. Because if he's pulling the drawer out and banging it in, no drawer i've ever maybe he had a boner and his dick was going up into the drawer and he was smashing his cock anyway the guy's basically getting his dick hammered by a drawer opening and closing by pep street it's the ikea ball stog. yeah <laughs> uh, for those who like the practicality and new design of contemporary <laughs> furniture but also enjoy cock and ball torture this is the table for you if you remember when it was funny in a movie for a cop to act outside of the law and just take things into his or her own hands and administer their own personal brand of justice remember when that was something that you were like yeah copper go do that <laughs> it's astonishing <laughs> how gleeful this movie is about yeah kind of fuck law right everybody grab an uzi just start spraying bullets everywhere hey frank got a tank we'll get to it later but it's it's a real cavalier attitude with like yeah yeah you're fine you're part of the team you're not a real police officer or nothing but you might as well have a tank Emo Muzz and his crippled testicles, they just start singing like canaries. So Strebeck and Joe Friday, they find out that there's going to be this big gathering of the members of Pagan. So they go down and get dressed up in undercover street gang member attire. And Joe Friday is wearing black army boots, green pants, a yellow and red plaid shirt, a biker jacket, a yellow wig that has a red mohawk. And he looks like the background character in a Muppet biker bar. Or anyone in the background of a Street Fighter video game. Yeah, just kind of bending their knees and bouncing up and down. Yeah, cheering on Zangief, you know. Now, Streebeck, he's wearing dark maroon pants, this deep crimson shirt. He's got suspenders, a hairnet. He has a fake mustache, and he looks like he should be heading for a shift at the Olympia restaurant to tell people, no Coke, only Pepsi, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. He looks like a Latino fishmonger. I don't know what that looks like, but it's what Tom Hanks looks like in this movie. So our two cops, they drive up this canyon road to the Pagan meeting, and then they get pulled over by a couple of other police officers, one of which is played by Peter Aykroyd, you know, the poor man's Jim Belushi. If Jim Belushi is too highfalutin. <laughs> Give me Peter Aykroyd. I've only got $17 and a coupon to Sizzla. Who is the Jim Belushi we don't like? <laughs> Peter Aykroyd. Where is his number? Oh, yeah. Chase the garbage truck. I got Gary Scaleri's number. Who? Gary Scaleri. I don't need Gary Scaleri. <laughs> Who's on the phone? <laughs> Nina Zamasco. Hey, one Zamasco in Hollywood. That's it. It's Casey <laughs> or Bust. Andy Gutenberg? Nope. I got Carl Pesci? No. I don't have Carl Pesci kind of money. I've got a Richie Buscemi on the phone. Uh, now you got something. <laughs> you know, he's the less handsome of the Buscemi brothers. They found him inside his older brother's body when he was four years old and they carved him out. He walks on his arms, but he can still deliver a line if you need him to. They share a psychic connection. 
It was actually Richie Bashimi who came up with the Chet line from Barton Fink. Now, he looks a little bit like Basket Case. He, remember, he was cut from his brother by a brilliant surgeon who did everything he could. But he died before he could get in to see him. Seeing him, watching R- Richie Bushimi on stage, <laughs> has made more atheists than Christopher Hitchens. Uh, he's a hideous monstrosity, is what I'm saying. Do we? W- <laughs> but he's affordable. So, the two cops that pull him over are fake cops, and they're just protecting the road up to this meeting and they see that Strebeck and Friday have pagan cards so they let them head on up to the gathering and when Friday and Strebeck get there they are given goat leggings to wear as part of the pagan ritual and then for some reason Strebeck breaks into some prop comedy and pretends that his goat <laughs> leggings are playful dogs again who is the comedic character in this film it needs to be Joe Friday and every time Tom Hanks does his shtick which again in a different movie I would adore Right, it's called Bachelor Party. These are the happiest goat leggings in the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's very funny. <laughs> it just doesn't belong in this scene. I do like the fact, though, that they're just given goat leggings. It's, you know, kind of membership has its privileges. That's nice. <laughs> they don't look cheap. I I, I appreciated no, that. they're goat leggings. Yeah. Hanks also makes a joke about the party being like the Rotarians. That's where Freddy's like, hey, we may get a little crazy on Saturday nights, but nothing like this, pal. Then we see on a billboard, it says Pagan, and we see what that stands for, which is people against goodness and normalcy again i think it's kind of funny it's just real dumb but i i like that kind of dumb and hanks then somebody comes around with a tray of pills and they're like hey you want some of these and hanks is like hey i'm gonna take a bunch and then he pockets a bunch of they pills. look like a bunch of commemorative holiday mike and ikes there's some good and plenty action for sure and then they're handing out free mugs of grog or hallucinogenic horse piss or whatever they're drinking and then the ritual just starts proper and then we see this high priest he shows up on this tall platform up in the air and he starts to summon this entity gaul and it's all a bunch of watered down temple of doom nonsense and the high priest he says prepare the virgin and then the priest he releases the bat that was stolen from the zoo and then Mm -hmm. he tosses the lion's mane off into this small pool of water below and then they bring out this virgin in the wedding dress that they stole from the landlady at the rundown motel and behind them are these long flowing red banners that look like nazi propaganda it looks like the wall you know the movie yeah. where you see bob geldof crossing his arms on stage and whatnot yeah it, it has that vibe to it except that there's more rhyming in this i think when they bring out the virgin her name is connie swale <laughs> the virgin connie swale <laughs> she's played by alexandra paul who was the girlfriend in christine mm-hmm. and she was on baywatch and Melrose Place. Was she also in Back to School, or was that somebody different? Maybe. We'll say maybe. Probably not, but probably so. The thing I think of, I associate with Alexandra Paul these days, she was kind of front and center in that uh, Who Killed the Electric Car documentary. Like, she was a big proponent of, like, alternate in- energy. And f- She was front and center? Would she kick Ed Begley Jr. out of the way? Beat it, Ed Begley Jr. I'm front and center. What are you talking about? Are you serious? It's me, Ed Begley Jr. My whole house is run on nothing but my own feces and this little pedal pad that I use. Look, we all believe in the same thing, but we want to put a pretty face on this, Ed. I mean, look at you. You're like one of those puppets from the Genesis video. And I was on Baywatch. Look, you got Baywatch money, okay? I was in Transylvania 69000 and singing elsewhere. I don't have the kind of money that you have, all right? This is all I've got. I'm the one who's pushing green technology, all right? Boy, we should send you to the Sahara, Ed. Say it. Don't spray it, you know what I mean? I don't even drive an electric car. I drive a car that's based on the technology from the Flintstones. It's powered by my feet. Whatever, Ed. I can barely even hear you anymore. Anymore. Yes, it's me, Alexandra Paul. I am the leader of the electric car movement. Yes, I'm willing no, to bullshit, do. Bullshit! I've had braces on my face since I was 11 years anyone? old. Yes, oh, a documentary. Of course, I'll sit down with you. 
My carbon footprint is negative. I have lived on my own urine and feces. It is the only thing that I've eaten and the only thing that I have drank for the last 37 years. I've eaten the same turd and drank the same cup of piss. Listen, if you talk to Ed, I wouldn't do a long interview. He's been drinking his own urine, if you know what I mean. And by what I mean is that he's been drinking his own urine. <laughs> what movie are we talking about again? Dragnet. So, they're at this big party with the Virgin Connie swale as soon as friday sees her he's like oh boy my heart's grown three sizes today i've got a place under my house in the crawl space right beside a dead german shepherd and my youthful piano teacher she'll fit snugly in between the two. Oh, i've got just the dress from an ex-girlfriend to wrap her body in i can't wait to feel her skin wrapped around my skin as an extra layer to keep me warm at night the Virgin Connie Swale will make one hell of a flesh-on-flesh -flesh blanket. Short hair, easy to cut. I appreciate that. So they push the Virgin Connie Swale off of this ledge, and she falls down into the pool of water below. And our two heroes jump into action, and they dive in the water to go save the Virgin Connie Swale. During this fight, Strebeck pops up, and he's wrestling the boa constrictor that was stolen from the zoo, while Joe Friday goes over to save the Virgin Connie Swale. And it kind of looks like, I don't know, the trash monster from Star Wars. Or the snake from Conan the Barbarian, the original 1980 John Milius movie. It's that kind of thing. And so Strebeck, to get out of a pickle, he just reaches in his pocket and pulls out a handful of those hallucinogenic Mike and Ikes and just throws them in the snake's mouth. Hey, I got some bitties. And then the snake gets all fucked up or he just kills it. I think he kills it. Man, whatever gets you through the night here, you know, like <laughs> you're being attacked by a giant snake. There is part of the reptile brain, no pun intended, that is going to kick in at that point. And just be like, it's me versus snake. And whatever my th high minded thoughts about preserving God's great creatures are going to fall to the wayside when it's wrapped around me trying to smother me. Joe Friday and the Virgin Connie Swale and Strebeck, they all escape into some steam tunnels and then they find themselves in an exit where they are confronted by this angry mob of pagan middle-aged losers. And then Strebeck immediately commands respect by shooting a gun into the air. And then everybody just tries to escape and run off. And the Virgin Connie Swale, during the tussle, she pulls the goat mask off of the high priest and she sees that it is Reverend Worley, Bo. Shocking. Yes. And if I may, Chad, when the big mob confronts our heroes, what uh -huh. they're chanting is kill the good. And if you describe the goings on of this party, uh -huh. just like, hey, we're going to get together. There's going to be guys walking around with pills. We're going to listen to some music. You got to wear goat leggings. But we're going to give them to you. I don't want to wear goat leggings. It's got to be goat leggings. You're going into it saving 50 bucks. But then we're going to take a virgin. We're going to throw her into a pit. This giant snake is going to eat her while we watch all whacked out on pills and booze. Does that virgin have a like a friend or a sister or something I can talk to? They'll re recruit one. But if you <laughs> describe that evening to Nighttime me. Nighttime is the right time. Nighttime is the right and, time. And then if I ask you like, hey, what if the virgin and escapes oh we're just gonna all chase her down like a mob chanting <laughs> kill the good and i saw that description on meetup i would pause for more than a minute chad i would be like mm. i mean i don't want to hurt anybody but i kind of want to see big ass snake eat somebody <laughs> and all those free pills that's a profit maker if you ask me like i'll take a couple but I'm going to pocket a bunch. I got a buddy of mine. Listen to this. He repairs used vibrators and then sells them overseas. I think he can hook us up with some sort of distribution channels. <laughs> Hi, goat legging pill distributor. <laughs> the only way I can get off is by using my vibrator, taking my pills, and creating these long <laughs> scissors that I'm going to attach to this albino's hands. I'm going to dye his hair black. <laughs> <laughs> What is going on? I don't know. I'm going to call the whole thing Frankenweenie. Isn't that absurd? Joe Friday and Strebeck, they find the car that was stolen from them earlier. They jump in it and then they escape from the angry mob as they fire guns all over the place. And as they drive off, I think Joe Friday and the Virgin Connie Swale, they fall in love, or at least that's what the music tells me is going on. And then they arrive at the Virgin Connie Swale's house and it looks like she bought it from Miss Yvonne. It's all pink and, <laughs> right. you know, idyllic. It's Barbie's dream house for serial killers. <laughs> like, I really admire how you leave your windows open 
open, ma'am. That's really handy for me. I like how you don't have any drapes or blinds. You can see right into the house. I like how the bedroom, you can see right into the bathroom and the shower is clearly right across the other side. You don't have to have a telescope or anything to see what's doing in there. Could you help me move this couch into the back of a van? How long has that street lamp been out? Nobody been around to fix it. Good. <laughs> so Joe Friday and Strebeck, they head back to police HQ where they relay what happened at the Pagan meeting to Captain Gannon and in the scene they kind of dance around and it's played for laughs but it yields no laughs and Strebeck says hey I have directions to the compound so they call up police commissioner Jane and everybody's going to meet at the compound to show them hey this pagan ritual really happened so everybody shows up and the place is empty there's no evidence there's nothing that says you know this satanic happening went on the night before so Joe Friday and Strebeck they get kicked off the case by orders of police commissioner Jane and this is where Harry Morgan is like Joe your uncle would be real disappointed in you I hope when you go home tonight that you masturbate with sandpaper instead of lotion that's that's a direct quote Joe Friday brings the Virgin Connie Swale down to uh, the police station to go through mug shots to look for any familiar faces and while she's turning the pages across the way Joe Friday is reading his alt-right erotic fuck fiction in his magazine that he bought and he's got these big saucers of eyes like mm, never thought about doing that before and the Virgin Connie Swale she doesn't find the guy they're looking for and Joe Friday says don't worry Virgin Connie Swales don't worry the guy who abducted you and dressed you in a wedding gown and threw you off the ledge into a pool filled with a boa constrictor as a human sacrifice is probably a hundred miles from here he's definitely not around and quite frankly not that creative wait till you see what I've got in store for you Virgin Connie Swale <laughs> thrown in a snake pit ha child's play wait till you have lotion lowered to you in a basket what are you about a size 14 Virgin Connie Swale perfect I'm a size 12. Let me ask you a question. Would you fuck me, Virgin Connie Swale? I'd fuck me. <laughs> so the Virgin Connie Swales heads off to go do whatever she does when she's not being abducted or looking through mugshot photos. And Joe Friday heads over to visit Strebeck at his apartment now. About this time, Emo Mush, he shows up and he's in this catering slash rape van uh, for some Italian restaurant. I think it's Alphonse and Gaston's. And Joe Friday goes up to uh, Strebeck's apartment, he knocks on the door, and then a fellow female police officer officer opens the door to some real sexy saxophones mm -hmm. i did like that there's an empty cardboard box for miller high life right outside the door maybe that beer earlier belonged to strebeck hey you think detective strebeck you really know how to greet a man it turns out that strebeck and this blonde female cop were having sex mixed with a little light bondage involving handcuffs around strebeck's wrists sure good for strebeck eh, you know they've been dating for almost 12 hours sometimes you need to experiment some gets a little boring after a while you want to keep it alive. Strebeck gets dressed and he comes out of his apartment and he suggests that he and Joe go get sushi. But instead, their car blows up. I'll bet it was Emil Muzz that was behind it, Bo. Yeah, and Joe Friday says as much and then also says, my hat was in that car. So Hank says, I know you've had a rough morning. How about we go get the best coffee in town? Cut to a strip club at 10 a.m. <laughs> filled with pasty lowlifes. The kind of people that you would imagine sitting front and center in front of strippers that are working the 10 a.m shift during the week the thing that is unrealistic about the scene is the quality of dancers at 10 a.m you are in los angeles you know what i mean they gotta work their way up maybe so man but that still feels generous at any rate i actually think the gag where the lady bends over between her legs as joe friday is drinking coffee and he just does the ma'am you know i think that's kind of funny i think again i i like dan Aykroyd as this character for the most part the strippers are wearing pasties on their nipples dan Aykroyd doesn't seem to be as hypnotized by these women as he did when he saw that 43 year old woman's nipples maybe their nipples are what does he mean that's what dave foley said as soon as you see the nipples then you've seen everything all right maybe he's just like these are too small i need an older woman with broader hips that way i can fit inside big knuckles long fingers a giant cock. That's the kind of thing I'm into. Have you met George <laughs> Baker? You know who should have played Strebeck in this movie? Gary Busey. That would have made this movie an instant classic. Oh, shit shit you're right <laughs> joe joe i don't worry get the greatest cup of coffee that you've ever had in your whole life <laughs> what are you doing are you gonna sit there and tell me that is not the best coffee you've ever had while she is shaking some of the best titties you've ever seen right in your face come on man piss on the yankees piss on the indians joe friday i want to arm wrestle you right now come on <laughs> 
<laughs> Did I ever tell you that I once killed a werewolf? My nephew had this souped up wheelchair. He was a cripple. I don't mean to come at you out of nowhere, but how would you feel about you and me forming a band? I'll be lead singer. You can do backup or vice versa, brother. I don't care. Peggy Sue. Peggy Sue. Come on, Joe. Sing it with me. Come on. I can even do that weird thing where you're like, uh-oh. I can do that, man. <laughs> Streebeck and Joe Friday. They come up with this plan to follow up on the stolen chemicals based on a lead they got at the strip club. And it turns out that all of this is kind of connected with the pagan investigation. And this bribed informant tells them that this illegal drug lab was being hidden by a front pretending to be a fresh, wholesome milk factory located on the Warner Brothers studio lot between New York City and the San Francisco Wharf. It is one of the most sound stagiest sound stages you've seen in a while. <laughs> but again, I find that shit real charming. I expected there to be like a, a churro kiosk and a t-shirt stand. Uh, just a woman coming through in a, like a pale blue <laughs> dress with a, a megaphone that's just like <laughs> and if you'll see right now they are shooting Dragnet. A couple of Vegas girls and some Battlestar Galactica warriors walking along. Hey. That is Dan Aykroyd talking to Tom Hanks right there. They're uh, two of the stars of the movie and you can see they get along pretty good. Uh, they seem pretty happy. So we're just going to keep it moving right through this scene. And we're everybody. walking and we're walking and we're walking. Walking. Come on, people. Thank you so much. Cut. Oh, were you shooting? <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. Everybody back to one. <laughs> Cut to later that night, and we're outside this milk factory, and three ethnic youths show up. There's a, one of them is black, one of them is Asian, and one is Hispanic. You not a bit a ton of crime. And they want to bum a smoke from Joe Friday, which leads one of the street youth to pull a switchblade on Joe Friday, and Joe Friday just starts beating him up, and then the Asian guy pulls out nunchucks. Man, how <laughs> the 80s love nunchucks. Let me count the ways. <laughs> Immediately, Joe Friday is like, hmm, I think the proper name you're looking for is Nunchaku, and I know how to handle it in 27 ways. And then just immediately disarms the guy and, like, takes his nunchucks and hits the dude with it and hits one guy with oh the top of a trash can like Sonny Corleone. He beats up these teenagers that are all 25 years old in short work. Which is why the last line of the scene doesn't land because all of them are 45. And he goes, <laughs> and on a school night too. And you're like, uh, who cares? I mean, what are they, are they teaching in the morning? <laughs> is it a roving gang of substitute teachers? <laughs> So about this time, Tank comes rolling into frame with this battering ram front that has a little plate that says, have a nice day at the very tip of the spear. And the tank crashes into the milk factory and milk goes everywhere. And now for some reason, Joe Friday is in a hazmat suit and Strebeck pops out and he's the one driving the tank and he's in a hazmat suit as well. And it turns out that they've raided the wrong place. And the milk factory is next to the Gaston and Alphonse catering front, which is where Emil Muzz uh, was driving the van earlier. So essentially what had happened was that the chemical factory was over in the Italian catering building and not necessarily associated with the milk factory directly, right? The way I kind of read this is that maybe both owned by right. Pagan, but like one is okay. kind of a, like there's a false front and then there's the real front kind of thing. Right. Um, this shit is way too complicated for the movie that we're in here. I feel like, like there's a thing later where they dump all the magazines out on the lawn of, uh, the, the bait mansion. Right. Somebody was moving out of college <laughs> and they were like, we got to put them somewhere. Right. It's like, why bring them back? It's just the dumbest. <laughs> They're driving on the road and Strebeck is watching TV on his watch, which this was a real thing. Yeah. Because in 1983, Seiko had a TV watch that had this giant battery pack and you could tune in and watch like VHF channels. Ah, uh, it was simpler times, Chad. Uh, you know what? They were ahead of their times with technology. They were ahead of their times with corrupt religious leaders. I think that's yeah, it. Yeah, that's it. That's as forward thinking as this movie gets. If, if you forgot about the police abuse, don't worry, there's more on the way on the tv we see police commissioner jane and she's just shitting all over the current mayor of los angeles because the whole city's just going to hell in a handbasket <laughs> okay you know what give it a couple of years until rodney king shows up and that 
verdict rolls out, you ain't seen nothing yet, sister. I'm the law and order commissioner. So Christopher Plummer is speaking at this event, whatever it is, and then says, and by the way, Jerry Caesar, the lisping smut peddler that Bo and Chad like so much, has donated a million dollars to the moral advance movement. (laughs) Why is he doing this? This would never happen. Hugh Hefner wouldn't give a million dollars to this guy. Bob Guccione? No. Larry Flint? You better wake up and apologize to Mr. Flint for even thinking about that. But that's why this movie is so overcomplicated, because we learn later that Jerry Caesar never did any such thing. Christopher Plummer just announced it. And then when Jerry Caesar meets him and is like, what the fuck, man? He's like, no, no, no. I This is how we get the mayor to your place. It's all, again, this is way too convoluted. Don't worry about it. We cut back to police HQ and it's nighttime and Strebeck and Joe Friday, they're going to part ways. And Strebeck says, hey, Joe, what are you doing at night? What's going on? Tell me about yourself. I'm your partner. We should be friends. And Joe Friday's like, listen, Bob, you don't need to know about my personal life. What I do and what's under my house is none of your business. So Joe Friday drives off and Strebeck follows him on this BMW motorcycle that he has. Strebeck's got a pretty good life. And uh, Joe Friday shows up at another fake house on the back lot of the movie studio and he goes inside. And then Strebeck does a little comedy about Nightmare on Elm Street. It's not very funny. I mean, Hanks is trying to do the best with what he's given, but it really falls flat. It's fun to see Tom Hanks being old Tom Hanks, but it's not a very good bit. And then he wonders aloud, I wonder what kind of hose monster might be inside there. And out comes Joe Friday. Daddy wants to fuck. <laughs> Daddy wants to <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a finger that they find in the lawn outside the house. And... <laughs> Joe Friday comes out with this little old lady right. and it turns out that it's his grandmother. Bo, you're not going to believe this. Her last name is Mundy. What? That's crazy. What? Hey, Granny and, Monday, it's your birthday. How about we go celebrate your birthday? So Strebeck crashes this date that uh, Joe Friday's going to have with his grandma and they go to the famous Brown Derby restaurant and Joe Friday, it turns out, has invited the Virgin Connie Swale to join them for dinner. And Granny Muddy, she's so happy because she is clearly worried that Joe Friday is gay. I don't think gay is the biggest fear here. I think what's going on in the basement is a concern as well. And she'll be alive, Joe. (laughs) She'll be able to talk to us. She won't be gagged and bound like all the others, Joe. This isn't the Lars movie again, is it, Joe? (laughs) No matter how many times we watch that together, I still think it's weird. I'll never not (laughs) think it's weird. But the the fucked up thing about this whole arrangement is they get there and the Mater D is like, oh, we have your bottle prepared. And Joe Friday is like, what the fuck? And Tom Hanks cops to it. He says, hey, I had Don Perignon delivered to the table. I I stopped off and I called. And and he says, like, I thought you want the most expensive thing on the menu on your bill tonight because you're a public servant. How funny is that? And Joe Friday is just like, "Mm mm-hmm. And meanwhile, I, as a viewer, was like, the fuck? You just charged, let's be conservative, $200 worth of champagne on a Uh dinner that was going to be $150 max. Oh, yeah. That was before their asses hit the seats. You were already in for $200. Right. Because it's not like Pep Strebeck at any point was like, hey, let me pick up the bill. He was just like, no. (laughs) Hey, how about we get bottle service? What? I don't even know what that is. (laughs) That sounds simultaneously stupid and expensive. As well as very titillating and exciting. I'll I'll feel like a real player if we have bottle service. During this dinner, the Virgin Connie Swale looks over at a different table where it turns out that Reverend Worley is having dinner with the police commissioner as well as Captain Gannon. And then the Virgin Connie Swales, when she sees the Reverend Worley, she goes into the homina, 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 homina. And she's freaking out because that was the guy who dressed her up in a bridal gown and chunked her off of a ledge to be eaten by a snake. Joe Friday is like, well, time to take out the trash. Except that's not what he says. He actually, when Tom Hanks is like, hey, you need to be sure. You need to be very sure that you're right about this. That Aykroyd says, look, I'm just enforcing the public health code that there is no free roaming vermin allowed in the restaurant. So he gets up and goes to the bathroom to chase Whirly down. He confronts him while he's taking a shit which I do not think this is the first time that Joe Friday has confronted a suspect in a public bathroom while he's defecating. When he confronts 
Whirly, who has taken a shit on the other side of this door. <laughs> Joe Friday just starts with, my partner and I witnessed that little torchlight picnic you threw last night. We're going to put you where your kind always ends up, in a 7x7 seven seven foot gray-green metal cage in the 15th floor of some hundred-year-old penitentiary, with damp, stinking walls and a wooden plank for a bed. Sure, this city isn't perfect. We need a smut-free life for all of our citizens. Cleaner streets, better schools, and a good hockey team. But the big difference between you and me, mister, is you made the promise, and I'm going to keep it. And the rightfully... <laughs> why i never did that in drama club i don't know because you didn't give a shit about anything no that's true if you had i would have been the guy taking the shit on the other side of the wall thanks i appreciate that <laughs> hey we could have been partners <laughs> we were too lazy to do anything what is the, the least path of resistance to a diploma wait you got a diploma <laughs> I mean, I don't have a copy or anything. I I presume <laughs> that I graduated. I went on a college. So I, I assume that the college people looked at some paperwork. I don't know. I, I tried to stay out of it, quite frankly. Joe Friday goes back. He drags Whirly out to the table to where... Yeah, the commissioner and Harry Morgan are having dinner. And he's just like, hey, I got your hero, the guy whose ass you've been kissing through this whole movie. I'm taking him downtown, see? What? what, what, what? That's outrageous. Yeah. Joe, let this man go. And then the Captain Gant's like, Joe, this is unacceptable behavior. Your father, <clears throat> Uncle uh, Joe Friday, would have been really upset by this. I'm going to need your badge. You're off the force. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? The police union, fuck that. You're not taking this dude's badge without a full investigation. They take away all of uh, Joe Friday's credentials, right? Is this where right. th that happens? Then they leave the restaurant all sad. And then Granny Mundy's like, hey, Strebeck, let's get on the back of your motorcycle and maybe you can go and tie me up it was vice versa it was Strebeck being kind of a granny chaser where he's like hey have you ever had a chili dog on the back of a motorcycle you sexy old thing and she's like well i never have hop on i think i think your nephew might get it wet tonight and if you play your hey, cards no <laughs> I know. Hey, Nor. Hey, Streebeck. Let me ask you a question. I realize. If your motorcycle was a hot dog, would you eat it? <laughs> would you cover it in chili and onions? Don't jerk me around, Streebeck. It's a simple question. It's saying chili dog in that voice. It led me astray. <laughs> Chili dog. If my motorcycle was a hot dog, I'd eat it. Say, you think you think you could power a motorcycle on nothing but chili dogs? I do. Alexandra Paul did a documentary. <laughs> they killed it. Listen up, guys. If you think you can power these motorcycles on nothing but chili dogs, do you understand the carbon footprint when you come in and you slaughter pigs and cows and chickens? All right? Oh, what? You need to be eating veggie dogs oh, Ed, if you're going to power your motorcycle. What is that, Ed? Oh, chili. I've been behind chili dogs for years. You've been behind nothing for nothing. Ed. You've been riding my coattails. You have the pinched face of a cartoon character. I was supposed to do the voice of the vampire grandpa uncle in Hotel Transylvania 6. I can't even understand him anymore. If anyone would like to talk about chili dog powered motorbikes, I will be happy. That was my idea. That was my idea. And Howie Mandel stole it. He stole my idea. Stephen first ate his boogers. I said it. The whole thing turned out to be a dream. So Joe Friday it gets in his car with the Virgin Connie Swale, and then he proceeds to reenact the final night of the Black Dahlia's life. <laughs> <laughs> the two of them drive up and they park in a parking lot underneath the Hollywood sign that doesn't exist. Are you familiar with the term bisection? Why would they do this? Why would they fictionalize a parking lot under the sign? And also, why just take her up there if both of these characters are known to be these, like, uber-conservative characters? Like, they're gonna go make out? Like, why don't you have them in public doing roller skating or something that would be more befitting their characters? As opposed to, let me take you somewhere obscure, somewhere out of sight of everyone. Just you and me. A place where someone named Muzz or Scuzz might sneak up on us. The thing I like most about this parking lot under the Hollywood sign, other than the fact that it doesn't exist, is that it is uniquely located in such a way that no one can hear you scream. Try it. Scream all you want. No one can hear you. It's acoustically perfect to remove your skin from your body. You know what else I like about it? The altitude. Sister, you can roll a body right off the side of this thing and it'll go for miles. 
by the time the wildlife gets a hold of it, they'll never know where you dumped it. And if they find what's left over, they're not going to know what you are. They're going to wonder if you're a human, a Sasquatch, a raccoon, or quite possibly a combination of all three. My guess is your next of kin will be notified that a coyote skeleton was found in the desert. These two lean in to almost kiss, but as they do it, Emo Muzz, he just picks up the back of the car because they're now in a Yugo and just flips the car over bumper over bumper. Then we see Emo Muzz come up and he just pumps a shotgun and points it at Joe Friday's head. And in any other movie, the next time we see Joe Friday, it is going to be either in a closed casket or at a crime scene that looks like a pumpkin full of red jello exploded. Right. It's just a collar and a, and red spray <laughs> like Marvin in the back seat of Pulp Fiction. What the fuck am I on brain detail? Yeah, I hit a bump. So then we cut to Tom Hanks. Well, Strebeck starts doing his Joe Friday voiceover. Hey, it's Tuesday morning. Hey, it's crazy. I'm fucking another lady cop. Look, I'm shaking out some rubbers. There's none left. I've been fucking all night. Which is what happens in the scene. He shakes a bottle of Titans and nothing nothing doing. Out comes some dust. And then he, <laughs> he calls the Virgin Connie Swale. He calls her mom. Well, no, he calls her house. And her mom oh, that's answers. that's right, because she lives at right, home. Right, she lives with her mother. Because she's 17. And there's a whole conversation that's like, no, Joe never stayed out all night before either. I'm worried too. What are you wearing? Tell me slowly. I know I'm in bed with another lady right now, but I'm open to suggestions. Do you have any rubbers? Could you get over to my house? Yeah, it's, it's the apartment right next to the parking lot where that car blew up a couple of weeks ago. My bedroom is BYOC. Bring your condoms. You'll know which one it is. There's an empty cardboard box of Miller High Life out front. Or two or three. And it's the 80s, you know. HIV is rampant. That's why I'm having sex with condoms. You know that I'm rapping if she's clapping. Speaking of rapping, stick around to the end credits of this movie. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> he goes to Harry Morgan. who's like, hey, nobody see Joe Friday all night. And Harry Morgan does a real good who cares it's pretty good (laughs) and he says you want to start trying to find joe friday start checking sanitariums radar why are you wearing that dress clinger is that the second jamie farr reference in this show it feels like we started doing the show yesterday (laughs) at least this season then like tom hanks is like joe friday is my partner and he storms out of the office and he sees an old buddy of his who's like, hey, Pep Streeback, what's going on, man? And uh, the guy looks a little sloppy and his hair's a little scruffy and stuff. And Tom Hanks is like, hey, nice to see you. And then he stops and goes, hey, wait a second, mister. If you know section 804.10.22.12, we hut, hut, hut. Gives him basically the Joe Friday speech. And it, nothing really comes of that. It's not like he becomes Joe Friday at any point. It's just like he has this moment and kind of shakes it off. He's kind of rubbing off yeah, on right. I guess. It's like they're both rubbing off on each other or whatever. Let's get to the graveyard. All right, so here is the plot of the movie Laid Bare, where Jerry Caesar shows up in a solid cold Rolls Royce, which is pretty sweet, (laughs) and meets Christopher Plummer at the cemetery. And this is where we learn that the contribution wasn't Jerry Caesar's idea. It's just something that Plummer announced. I saw your so-called announcement about me giving you $1 million. You can do yourself a favor, friend. You can try the lottery. (laughs) Yeah. Christopher (laughs) Plummer's like, you know, we had to do this. So you're going to have this big bait party tonight. And you're going to give me this check at that party. And because of that, the mayor's got to be there is the plan. Reverend, you got balls as big as choice bills. (laughs) Man, how Damney Coleman says choice bills. Is one of the great things in cinema. <laughs> he calls him Reverend. <laughs> yeah. You got bald the biggest choice belt. Choice belt. It's so good, man. <laughs> and so sadly, he leaves the scene. Oh. And I know, man. I want a whole movie that's nothing but Jerry Caesar and his, you know, like, a day in the life of. Commissioner Jane pops up behind this headstone in the graveyard, <laughs> and she runs over to the Reverend, and she says, I don't trust that man. And then Reverend Worley says, that socially retarded hedonist thinks he's going to be alive tomorrow. (laughs) And the commissioner, too, is just like, you're so deliciously evil. Like, it is, we're playing these characters big, people. And then Hanks, we cut to him, and he's got the Polaroid that has the Muscle Beach bit on it. And he's like, hey, maybe I should go here and check it out. I think this could be a clue. So he goes to Muscle Beach where he finds Amal Mud weightlifting and Hank's just 
pulls a gun on him. Yeah. And is like, hey, you're going to tell me what Joe Friday is, or I'm just going to shoot you in the street. Nobody bats an eye. Yeah, everybody's just like, hey, out of his way, he's a police officer doing police officer things. Yeah, you blow that guy's brains out. Make sure you wipe down that bench. Just get gym etiquette, okay? Hey, everybody cleans up after your every set, all right? Even if, if your set is pulling a trigger, brother, doesn't matter. Somebody's still got to use that station after you. Can I get a spot over here? Don't make me call Craig. Craig is our manager. He The policy's right there, man. You check it out. Look, I'm dialing Craig right now. Clean it up. Clean it up. Strebeck asks O'Halloran, who's got these hundreds of pounds over his head, to confess as to where he can find his partner. And so we cut to the Getty Observatory at night, where Joe Friday and the Virgin Connie Swale are tied up like they're Dudley Do-Right and Pearl Pureheart. And then Reverend Worley shows up and he unties the Virgin Connie Swale and informs Joe Friday that his plan is to kill Joe Friday. What is Reverend Worley's plan to go to the porno mansion for the 25th anniversary of to get, the money, get a check for a million dollars that may or may not be real. Then he's going to kill a cop, Joe Friday, and then he's going to kill Jerry Caesar with poison and gas the and the mayor. This seems like a very convoluted plan yeah. with a whole lot of like <laughs> opportunities for things to go sideways. The whole idea is that he's going to control both the pagan cult of ne'er-do-wells and lawbreakers and also be the figure of the moral action mothers mama. mothers mothers calm your children. right like he's gonna be the dude who is basically putting the city at war with itself and he's gonna profit on both ends of it all right good luck with that shithead <laughs> so after uh we realize like the commissioner is in on it we know like oh well like he's got to get out of town at some point he drives off with the virgin connie swale in his limo at the exact same time strebeck shows up on his motorcycle or hell it may be a glorified moped for all i know looks like the kind of thing that ed bagley jr would drive and and so he gets joe friday out of uh the bondage then they get on his motorcycle and there's a whole bit about like hey hug me like connie swale and then he hugs him so tight tom Hanks is like whoa, whoa. <laughs> When he's driving the motorcycle. And they're being chased by a bunch of henchmen. It's pointless. Right, and they just go off-road, which is the benefit, I guess, of being on a motorcycle, yeah. and escape the car full of thugs. And then we cut over to the 25th anniversary bait party, which is the mayor showing up and Whirly, the reverend, just behind him. But we're right. watching from the bushes with Joe Friday and Tom Hanks. Street back. Yeah. And Joe Friday's like, I don't see the Virgin Connie Swale in the, the car with the reverend. And he's basically saying, like, I need to get in that party and I need to go after her. But Tom Hanks is like, hey, I don't mean to be the guy that spoiled the party or nothing, but you're not a cop anymore, Joe. Go home, Joe. Yeah. And by the way, my name's Pep. It's not Bub or Mr. or Junior. It's Pep. Friendship starts with first names Joe. And so Hanks does what Joe Friday was going to do, which is slips behind a car and kind of sneaks into the party. And then we get one of our sadly few remaining scenes with Jerry Caesar. I know. It's at, during this bait mate 20th anniversary party, Worley and the mayor walk up to Jerry Caesar and the mayor says, enough of the civility nonsense. Do you have a check for a million dollars to give the reverend or whatever his name is here? And then Jerry Caesar says, all in due time, mayor. And the reverend says, why don't I hold it till the final presentation? So Jerry Caesar hands over the check by holding it between his index finger and his middle finger. But as the reverend reaches out, he wiggles it back and forth and teases it with yeah, him. It's a real dick move. It, it's awesome. Then Jerry Caesar says, we're about to start the talent show portion of the evening. Reverend, why don't you pull up a pew? I think you're going to find these girls socially redeeming. <laughs> yeah, so, so sure enough, they do go to a talent show. And Jerry Caesar at one point, like it's, it's one of the bait mates singing the Star Spangled Banner. And Jerry Caesar leans over to Christopher Plummer and he's like, hey, River, how you like the pipe on that girl thing of the Star Spangled Banner? You surprised? <laughs> Just fucking with him. Christopher Plummer is like, hmm, yes, I, I expect there'll be a lot of surprises this evening. <laughs> Outside, some dump truck shows up and just spills out a small hill of pornography made of the stolen 25th anniversary issues. of. Right, Dave. but again, why bring this back just to burn it? I don't, I don't anyway. know. Anyway. And then the Italian catering truck shows up and it's there. And then a tanker truck from the milk factory is there, but it's now full of the poisonous gas. And Strebeck is watching all of this while he's hiding in the bush. And then Strebeck climbs into the back 
back of the catering van and he knocks a guy out using a telephone book. Uh-huh. This was the guy who's kind of overseeing the command center of this operation. And then Strebeck jumps on a phone. He calls up Captain Gannon and says, hey, I'm up with the baby 20th anniversary. You need to set up the SWAT team. The Pagans are here. They're all over the place. And Gannon's on the phone. His wife's sitting beside him and his face says, I'm going to fire this Strebeck right now. And you're like, I don't know that he's going to send up the SWAT team based on his physical demeanor. Yeah, for a second, I thought they were the old couple from uh, Arachnophobia. They're just going to end up dead with their fingers in the mutual popcorn bowl. Mother, we're going to watch what I want to watch tonight. All right, we'll watch who wants to be a millionaire. Back at the mansion, the Reverend leaves with his million dollar check and his henchmen just start pouring gasoline all over this giant pile of pornography outside the mansion's gates. Amongst the gasoline dousers and henchmen is Strebeck and he's now wearing one of the catering jackets doing his best to draw attention to himself by comically dousing gasoline on the magazine. Yes. He's just like, hey, hey, look at me. Look how I can splash gas in a very hilarious fashion. Squirt, squirt, squirt. Let me draw attention away from my face by holding the gas can right beside my head who's that asshole pouring gasoline out of his mouth christopher Plummer g- goes to amel muzz and tom hanks is like overhearing this conversation and christopher Plummer is like hey i'm going to acapulco with the virgin connie swale and you know you hold things down here amel i promise you'll be fine and then christopher Plummer tosses his cigar and and lights all the smut on fire, setting the, uh, yeah. that ablaze. Then we cut away from all those doings to Joe Friday, who is leaving the scene and is nearly run off the road by the cops who are driving dangerously and putting civilians in harm's way. And now he's on the other end of that. Dude, it's a caravan of police cars and SWAT team members and paddy wagons and tanks. It is a an onslaught of military-style response to whatever the hell is going on at this porno mansion. And he's just like, oh, I remember the good old days when I could respond with a military authoritarianism. Anyway, then we cut to the compound where that's exactly what's happening. Like, SWAT and Pagan guys are shooting at each other. Dude, they're just spraying bullets all over the place. A statue's dick is shot off, and that's kind of funny, I guess. And then out of nowhere, the tank from the milk factory raid shows up with the Have a Nice Day placard. It comes up and crashes through the front gate of the porno mansion, and then goes over the top of the pile of flaming pornography. The music that's playing during this scene is really reminiscent of indiana jones music there's a lot of like ba 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 da ba da ba da ba da ba ba da ba boop 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 bitty boop 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 it's kind of like how the, the opening music sounded a lot like chicka chicka it's like do that but only different enough that we don't get sued maybe it's just the context of what was happening on screen but the music also reminded me a lot of the music in stripes when the rv starts using the flamethrower and that kind of thing ira newborn did the music for this movie look john williams he had a plagiarism case on his hands if he wanted it but (laughs) He was like, just let him do his thing. It's fucking dragnet. As the tank rolls in and destroys the flaming porno, the front muzzle um, rotates around and kind of like knocks over some bad guys. And then Joe Friday pops out with the shotgun and just starts pumping people full of buckshot. And then Pep Strebeck screams out, thank God it's Friday. Man, again, it's one of those moments of like, holy shit, this civilian just drove a tank into a crime scene. Yes. And opened the door of said tank and just started firing a shotgun. How did he get in the tank? Did he just like overwhelm the person who was originally in it and just commandeer it on his own because he wants to have sex with the Virgin Connie Swale? I know 27 ways to render a human being unconscious using just my hands, mister. I grabbed the guy with the keys. I gave him what I call the Friday nerve pinch. You can up that to 37 if you include my feet because as you know, I have webbed toes. As does every American and Canadian and fish person. Strebeck then takes off his henchman slash catering coat and he just starts beating up his former fellow henchman. And then Emil Muzz, he's going to shoot Strebeck in the head and Joe Friday shows up and says, hey, you get your damn hands off my partner. And then Strebeck, he lets out this Pee Wee Herman laugh. At least that's what the subtitles told me that he did. Ha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe Friday's like, you're pointing a gun at my partner. Hey, Pep, cuff him. 
Hey, did you hear that? He called me Pep. We're friends now. He used my first name. We've turned a corner. Our characters have evolved and grown since we first met. I also really like when you, you see Pep Strebeck like disrobe his uh, pagan garb. When he uh, does it, he yells like, hey, everybody, it's me, Pep Strebeck. <laughs> Fucking cartoon character. Hey, it's me, baby Kermit. Jerry Caesar comes out and sadly is going to give us his final scene of the movie. And he goes over to Joe Friday and he says, Joe Friday, you saved my house and my gals. You get a lifetime subscription to Bait, Field, and Cream, Dollies. And I was like, Dollies? Wasn't on the warehouse. That's a new one. I haven't heard about Dollies. What is that? That's the one where every pictorial has a a pee shot. Oh, I thought it was like a lot of homages to 9 to 5 and the best little whorehouse in Texas. Like kind of like an early Dolly Parton cosplay magazine. It's a country music enthusiast magazine. It's not as sexy as the others, but it's more informative. Jerry Caesar says, Joe Friday, you can have anything you want. Money, bras, automobiles, anything. You just name it. And Joe Friday says, how about you get your hands off my suit? Okay, you got it, Joe. And then he leaves the film by looking at his Playmate model sidekicks and going, you girls hungry? Let's eat. That's it. Out he rolls to Denny's or something <laughs> late in the evening. That was crazy, wasn't it? Tonight at the 25th anniversary. Do y'all remember like four hours ago when there was like a gunfight going on and then a tank rolled in? Excuse me, can I please get some more syrup over here? Oh, this is crazy. Girl, did you hear them say there was poison gas? They were going to poison <laughs> us with gas. Here's the thing. Who do you think won the talent show? That's the real question of the evening. But in fairness, we, we did not see the last four acts. So we'll do that after. We're going to have a makeup day. You don't have to perform again. (laughs) JC, I got a question for you, though. That check you gave to the Reverend, did you really give him a million dollars? The check that I gave him uh, is not on a real bank account. It is from Millennial Mall Madness, a board game that um, I'm working on. And I signed the check Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So it's worthless. Also, I backdated it to the year 3722. By then, the Morlocks will be running the show. About now, the sun is coming up. <laughs> yeah, we're finally getting to the end of this movie, finally. Is this compound just littered with bullet-riddled cops and henchmen? The thing is, in this movie, <laughs> nobody actually gets shot. You see a couple oh, of people okay. fall down, but this is a very cops Ow, 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 I sprained my ankles. Guys, time out, time out, stop, stop, seriously, stop shooting. It's a lot of like, oh, grabbing my side and falling and stuff like that. And I need a bag of ice over here, guys. <laughs> This hurts. But I'm kind of okay with that as a decision, you know? Like, I don't need this movie to be bloody. Like, I don't need this to be heat with this kind of comedy. Dreamback shows up and says, Hey, I overheard the Reverend Worley is headed to Mexico in his private plane with the Virgin County Swales. We gotta move it! Before they can leave, Captain Gannon, for some reason, he shows up. And he's like, Hey, Joe, you're gonna need your badge. I never turned it in or filled out any paperwork to strip you of your job. You're still a cop. Quite frankly, I checked out a long time ago, Joe. I moved some papers around. I signed some forms, but that's all I do, Joe. Anyway, here's your badge back. Do you want my job, Joe? Are you looking for a promotion? I'm ready to get out of this racket. My last partner was Brad Pitt. Let me tell you a story about a box we found in the desert, Joe. I've had it. Half my day is spent sitting on the toilet. 100% of my day is spent reading the Farmer's Almanac. Joe, all my friends are dead, Joe. I'm alone. It's me and my wife. And we haven't been able to talk in 15 years. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you, Joe. We were never friends. We were never really even acquaintances. If she hadn't gotten pregnant, we never would have gotten married, Joe. The worst part was she lost the baby in the eighth month. I never loved her, Joe. You know who I loved? I loved your father, Joe. Your father, Joe Friday. He was your dad, not your uncle. You know what I spend my days thinking about, Joe? I think about the sweet touch of your uncle. Slash father. He was both. I think at the time that because I was the smaller, he would just pull me into his lap sometimes. It was both tender and playful. Joe, it was the happiest days of my life. He would pretend that I was a ventriloquist dummy, and he would tug on the back of my shirt, and I would make my mouth go up and down. And it brought him so much joy, but it brought me so much pleasure. He brought over a stuffed toy brought from the bedroom of that miscarried child, Joe. And we pretended to go to the fair, and he won that stuffed animal for me by guessing my weight. It was the happiest night of my life. We couldn't go out and do that in public, Joe. We couldn't go to the fair, so he brought the fair to me. I called that squirrel Sammy, and I have it today. 
I used to carry it around in the trunk of my patrol car. And whenever I met a frightened child, or let's be honest, a frightened adult, I'd introduce them to Sammy. And when they met Sammy, their problems didn't seem nearly as big as they were earlier in the day. That's because of your dad. Joe Friday. Having a lot of confusing feelings right now. I've got to go track down the Virgin Connie Swale, who's about to be sexually violated by my favorite television minister. Oh, yeah. Let's get to the creepiest thing in this movie. Like, (laughs) backloaded the eek on this one. So, Joe Friday. Hey, remember remember Joe Friday and Pep Street back there? They are uh, in pursuit of Connie Swale. They drive to the airport, but the plane is already taken off, and it flies over their heads. They're like, ah, she's gone. Then there's this moment where you see Christopher Plummer on the plane with the Virgin Connie Swale. And he yep. kind of caresses her cheek and she's just like, oh, no. He uses his middle finger to rub right down her jawline. Yeah, it's a real creepy move. And she's like, you're a freak. And his response is like, you'll get used to it. And it's like, oh, oh, no, not this late. Let's not do human trafficking so late in the film. You got to give me a heads up on that one. So that's real gross. But it turns out our bad guy has gotten away and he is going to violate this young woman. That is what the film would lead you to believe until Chad. Right. Da, 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 da. Man. Da, 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 da. It, like this jet flies right next door to christopher Plummer, and it's like right. the the lapd paint job there's a flashing blue light which i appreciate there's a siren that wails like woo and joe friday meh, meh. rips off his meh, meh. oxygen mask and is like you down does the finger point what prevents reverend worley from just nosediving this plane into the mountains of southern california you know narcissism mostly why would he land it's like well i've been caught i'm not going to jail well virgin connie swale take my hand we're going to hell together tonight the plane lands and reverend worley is arrested the virgin connie swale she smiles at joe friday who is like 20 years her senior and then they lean in to kiss again but then pep strebeck shows up and he's like hey look at me i'm in the middle of you too i'm preventing you guys from kissing oh oh joe friday is like hey don't you have some police work you should be attending i've got a whole lifetime to catch up on here pep or whatever. He just goes to make out some more with the Virgin Connie Swale. He puts her in a police car, which made me nervous. I was like, what deviant fantasy is running through this guy's head? He's now got his captive prey out of the frying pan into the fire, Virgin Connie Swale. You know, one day I picked up Pep, Virgin Connie Swale. It was the funniest thing. He had handcuffs on. You wouldn't want to try something like that, would you, Virgin Connie Swale? I'm just asking. It's fine if you don't want to. Up, oh, up, oh, up, oh, but now you're wearing handcuffs. Why don't you come down to the basement with me, Virgin Connie? Connie Swale. That's a little play I did <laughs> called The Real Dragnet. There's one of those Dragnet tag scenes where it's like Reverend Worley was charged with uh, attempted murder on two counts and yada yada. And there's a gag where he's like, he's currently serving 44 life sentences, which makes him eligible for parole in four years. And it's like, okay, I'm fine. Yeah. Wah, wah. And then it ends with another shot of Joe Friday at his cruiser rubbing the hood doing his narration as Tom Hanks shows up with his pretty lady cop girlfriend. Isn't he riding on the pol- the motorcycle that she's driving, like squatting like a frog? It's real weird. I don't know why he's sitting like that. Maybe he was constipated. Yeah. He's trying to work something the out. The Paul method of bowel movement. Certainly <laughs> could be. It's, you can't rule it out. Like Tom Hanks would have known about that. That's one thing we can we can be sure of. Friday and Strebeck, they go walking into work and Joe Friday says, I had the pleasure of spending the evening with Connie Swale. And Strebeck says, don't you mean the virgin Connie Swale? And Joe Friday gives them that look and the bump, 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 bump plays. His beady eyes and this sinister smile that says she's not a virgin anymore and nobody, and I mean nobody, will ever hear from her again because I cut out her tongue. You know, Strebeck, you can have as many virginities as holes. And the answer to your question is no, she's not a virgin in any of them anymore. Yeah, it's it's terrifying. And then the movie ends with the remix of City of Crime. It's a city of crime. 
it's this rap with Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd, you know, working the mic. That tells the story of the movie. Do you think that Tom Hanks' son, uh, the one that goes by Chet Hayes, yeah. do you think that maybe this was the only piece of work that he was ever exposed to by his father? And he just thought, hey, I'm going to follow my father's footsteps and become a rapper. I think it's what he saw and said, hey, I can do whatever the fuck I want. And if my dad ever says anything, I'm going to show him this. And that's Dragnet. Yeah. It's a pretty terrible movie. You know, all right. It is not a great movie. No, no one's arguing that point. I would say that Dan Aykroyd's performance in it is dedicated, if nothing else, and interesting a lot of times. And the Dabney Coleman stuff is tremendous. It's one of the worst movies Tom Hanks has ever made, and it's one of the best movies that Dan Aykroyd's ever made. <laughs> yeah, that's the right Venn diagram. For the kinds of movies we talk about on this show, this skews pretty high on this spectrum as far as, like, this is watchable entertainment. Dude, Hanks made The Burbs. He did all those Dan Brown novel adaptations. He was in that movie with Halle Berry that the Warchowski brothers or sisters did, Cloud Atlas. I like Cloud Atlas. I'm a Cloud Atlas apologist. I like that movie. I think this may be one of Ackroyd's best. You start going through the IMDb on him. You got Blues Brothers 2000 and Caddyshack 2. And it's like, man, Dragnet don't look so bad. I like looking at the himselfs on the Dan Aykroyd page, and it's nothing but like, the UFO Survivalist Podcast. Dan Aykroyd, glad you could be here today. Tell us all about your experience with UFOs and Men in Black. So that's Dragnet. It is Dragnet. Chad, we don't stop here. Do no, no, no. The, the good news is that we have a movie coming up in the next episode that everybody can agree is universally loved by children, adults, People across all cultures, there's nothing controversial or questionable about the film's source material or the legacy it left after leaving its primetime television slot over on CBS. And I'm speaking, of course, about the Dukes of Hazard. Oh, I thought you meant the Night Porter. Yeah, Dukes of Hazard. Who the hell picks these movies out for us? <laughs> Is this the one with Jonathan Knoxville? Yeah, this is the one with Jonathan Knoxville. This is the movie where everything is wrapped up in the Confederacy. Again, couldn't be better timing. No. I wasn't sure that we would address a movie that was more racist than Wild Wild West, and we might be able to do it. Oh, well, that's good news. Yeah, it is. Again, please send your emails to Bo Ransdell at pick6movies.com. Yes, I <laughs> check those never. But I'll tell you what, I never say this, but you can actually find me on the Twitter at Legion Podcasts is the, the Twitter handle. So if you message me there, I do actually read that on a semi-regular basis. I don't even know if I have Twitter. I don't recommend it. No, it's a cesspool of horrible, horrible nightmares. Unlike our show, which is full of nothing but positive and mirth and merriment and, and just good old good times. Yeah, stories of stolen stuffed animals, of deceased children that's really our sweet spot littered pornography and people shitting like ducks i can only assume this episode is about seven and a half hours long and i think if you've made it this far listeners then you deserve something special and uh in in typical pick six fashion we don't have anything we'll see you in two weeks everybody yeah.